everyone, Rob Sesternino here, and we are back with another Survivor Roundtable here, Roundtable number four, and I'm so excited because this is the day that the Survivor cast has dropped officially, so we have so much to talk I about and so much to look at here today with our panel as we are going to be talking about the Survivor class of 2014, and we're going to be talking about Tony and Sarah and Jeremy and Natalie here with this panel. Let's uh, talk. Let's meet everybody here who's with us today. Of course, uh, very excited to have with us to talk some Survivor. Here is uh, Jenny Autumn. Jenny, how are you? I'm great. Uh, you know, I was uh, with you guys last week for the Circle podcast, and uh, I was sick then. I'm still sick, but I'm improving. So, okay, <laughs> I'm glad to be talking Survivor, and I'm glad that we got some more photos and bios today. So I feel a little photos? lucky. Great photos to talk about. Amazing here photos, yeah. Of course, that we are very excited to have here with us on a roundtable. The great Haley Strong is here. Haley, how are you? I'm doing well. I can't believe you invited me to one of these to bring down the knowledge and the reputation of this entire <laughs> podcast network. Who's your person tonight that we're going to talk about? Do you have a favorite of the four that we're going to talk about? Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you. <laughs> okay. That was my favorite answer of ever. <laughs> uh, I'd, answer. Say, I'd say Natalie. You want my personal rankings right now? We're going... Natalie, Jeremy, Tony, Sarah. Natalie, Jeremy, Tony, Sarah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, of but course. at the top. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, <laughs> that's just a given. Very excited to have with us here a man who has already changed his phone wallpaper to be <laughs> season 40 photos. Here is Matt Ligori. Matt, how are you? This is the hottest cast ever, and these pictures today just took my breath away. How could I yeah, not make so them? Yeah, so much for background? oldest cast, hottest they cast are, ever. Every single one of them, or most of them, are just beautiful. <laughs> I, I, these pictures were great. I'm so excited that we got these today. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, we have, of course, with us. Uh, usually, we get to talk Big Brother with him, but he's here to talk some Survivor. Here is uh, Brent Walgamont. Brent, how are you? I am very psyched to be here. It's fun to just relax and take it easy and talk with some survivors. See, this is the best time to talk with me before the show has started and starts to irritate me. I feel like, <laughs> Rob, that's just a general rule. Okay. I, Brett, I was going to ask you before I introduced you, did uh, Survivor have Annie Leibowitz on location to do all of these uh, press photos? They look amazing. I like They actually put in the money for this because, like Matt said, literally everybody, almost everybody, looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love guessing. Like, the the, yeah. the yeah, the multiple outfits. Yeah, it was good. It was really, yeah. really good. Okay, so all right, so uh, we'll see how long this show goes before uh, Brent gets real shady and tells us uh, who had the worst cast photo. We'll see if we get to that tonight. <laughs> oh, I right. thought that's not what we were talking about tonight. I thought we were just here to do the critiques of the photos. Well, yeah, yeah that's what, <laughs> what, that's what we'll do. That that's what we'll do with Bryce in a couple of weeks. Uh, but we are going to talk about these four players. But of course, we want to hear from you uh, that we have our YouTube open we have we're on periscope we're on facebook we're on twitch we're streaming live and of course many of you guys are listening to the podcast after the fact if you want to join us for one more round table talking about survivor i will be back on monday night with one final panel we're going to talk about all of the one-time players who won in the 30s that's going to be michelle and adam and nick and wendell and ben coming up on monday night so be on the lookout for that and then we will you have mean our... you're gonna miss the bachelor to podcast about survivor I, it's gonna be early <laughs> early 7 okay. p.m eastern 4 p.m pacific uh so we that's be on the lookout for that so good a good reminder Haley. <laughs> and then on thursday night we will have our final circle round table talking about episodes 9 10 11 12 of the circle coming up tomorrow night that's going to be at 9 p.m eastern 6 p.m pacific if you want to join us live for that had a lot of fun on our circle round tables uh the last couple of weeks jenny you made such an impression on tim uh i he made such an impression on me like it, just so much so much better to even just talk to him like on a podcast besides just watching you know how amazing he is on, on the circle and you know 
I flattery gets you a lot of places. And the very fact that that Tim would uh, catfish as me, uh, you know, he's my new favorite person. Has so. he done that yet? Did he start he, yet? No. OK, like almost immediately after that podcast, I got um, he like liked a photo of mine from like a couple months ago. So I like I took a screenshot and I'm like, he's already scouting photos <laughs> for his catfishing. Again, yeah. So it's great. OK. All right. So. Matt, a lot of stuff dropped today. Can you give us the rundown of uh, everything that us Survivor fans were able to check out today? Uh, yeah, from what I saw, we got, uh, obviously, the cast photos came out today, which uh, I, for me, that was like the most anticipated thing. I, I could not wait for cast photos. Um, it's just, you want to see these people like, updated pictures you want to see them right before they're about to play the game what they looked like what they're wearing uh and a lot of them are wearing things pretty similar to what they wore last time which isn't a surprise but we got that uh we got uh, did we get any interviews with yeah we got the et canada interviews of course uh spent a good majority of the day watching some of those and uh we also got i, th I think just a couple of other interviews uh, jeff was talking about the twist and whatnot so uh, a pretty fun day and i don't know why i didn't see it coming maybe because the circle's in the way but uh, yeah it was a lot of a lot of stuff today Kind of snuck up on us. Yeah, the ET Canada has uh, 20 interviews up with the cast. They are uh, lengthy. Uh, they are uh, you know, real real good interviews uh, around, uh, you know, seven, eight minutes each. So a uh, great place to spend some time as uh, we are getting closer and closer to the premiere. We've got our bios as well. But we also learned today some more about the fire tokens. Dalton Ross had an interview with Jeff Probst, and I'm so excited that we have this panel here to explain to me, I still don't get the fire tokens. I, don't look at me. <laughs> I haven't anybody? heard of them yet, so this is a fun <laughs> ride for all Does of us. Does anybody want to attempt to explain the, from what I understand, Not everybody right. <laughs> gets a fire token, okay? Everybody gets a, gets a, a chip here. All right, here's your fire token, Brent. And right. then you get voted out and you give your fire tokens to somebody else. But then people on the edge of extinction then are doing something or they're, they're buying stuff for the people, but they don't have fire tokens. So because they the willed people, them all away. Yeah. How do the people on the edge of extinction, do they just have the stuff? I think and they then, earn them, right? They, they can win them. They can earn them in different tasks or, or whatever they're going to keep them busy with. Is that what it is? Or no, it's like, I, <laughs> When you said that, Rob, I had like instant flashback to hi Highway to Heaven where like, you know, Jonathan has the stuff, you know, <laughs> it's <laughs> sorry. It was, such a it was such a terrible reference. Like it's, it's such an 80s reference. Like anyway, no, I don't know if okay, they have boomer. the stuff or not, I, but they, and, do, but they apparently have fire tokens, though. That's, uh, that's yeah. the way it works. And my question is like, we're going to do this with 45 minute episodes as well. Like right? now there's like this mm -hmm. whole and other these people and yeah. of extinction uh, check ins. Yes. I, yeah, I'm still waiting we, for the surprise that that's not the case but well we can only hope that you know like hey to f check out cbs all access for you know yeah. uh, you know to see how this week's edge of extinction ended up playing out and we end up getting more of that on so at least where we can see it and have a chance to understand because Haley, it seems like that also then the people on the edge of extinction, they need the fire tokens because they are purchasing things that are going to make it easier for them to get back into the game. I thought at first like, oh, that whoever has the most fire tokens on the edge of extinction is going to be who gets back in the game. But I guess they're buying then things that will help make it easier for them to win the edge of extinction challenge. I am truly confused right now. Yeah. <laughs> we all, right, all are. Why? We all like, are. Like, for what reason are they doing this? Yeah. And okay. uh, I think that a lot of people feel like, okay, well, this seems like it's interesting. Uh, I, we don't know how they're going to pull it off. We don't know how we necessarily. Are they that, going to pull it off? Yeah. I don't, it doesn't feel like they're going to based on this description. And it's just right. strange that they, they, you know, obviously they've already tested Edge of Extinction on, on another season, but they didn't want to test this on another season. Like, I, I guess. Why don't they just mm -hmm. leave everything alone? Oof. What they should have done with season 40 was just one world it, have everyone on one beach and call it a day and say, have fun, everyone. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Interesting. So you feel like that that would have been better where then you could have had Rob and Amber interacting and then Why all these not? people that, well, I think that they want because to separate they're married? from these like, people. Ethan would vote me out in an instant if he had a chance. Ethan. 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 Which yeah. Ethan? Yeah. Who's yeah. Not oh, Ethan's my Ethan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, Ethan's on would probably Both do it like. too. He would meet me and be like, I hate her. He's the nicest guy on earth and he would still be like, not for me. Thank <laughs> you. Okay. 
Uh, Matt, have we learned anything interesting from any of the people that we're not going to talk about here tonight? Did you, did you uh, get any interesting tidbits from any of the interviews that you came across today? Everyone has kids. Yeah. <laughs> they Everyone all have her. kids. They're all, I'm so sad. I'm going to cry out here because I'm leaving my kids at home. And I'm like, first of all, I mean, very much appreciate them all leaving their kids at home to come out here and play this like epic season. Uh, you know, uh, if they, if anyone didn't want to come out because of that, it would have been uh, pretty disappointing as a fan, but glad that they all made it out. Yeah. Uh, but what did we take away from Can that? Can I also I add that? Leaving your kids to go play Survivor is not a bug. It's a feature. That is <laughs> the number one thing calling me. I had no desire to go play Survivor until I had kids. And they said, wait, what? what? 39 days out of my house? Well, and with all of them, almost all of them in this situation now, it really kind of weakens that that story, you know, where where it's like, oh, I'm doing this for my family. Like everyone, almost mm -hmm. everyone on this cast is a parent and has a family to provide for at this point. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a popular, uh, you know, story at this point with this cast. But yeah. like when when our youngest player is 28. This, mm -hmm. If only all like reality casts were like this, like, you know, the, the 28 to 48 range would be a lot better, but yeah, main, what can you do? main takeaway that uh, involves somebody not being talked about tonight is that uh, the one person that I think was brought up the most times that really needs to look out, which you discussed her already. Uh, Kim Spradlin's name was in almost everybody's mouth. Uh oh, oh really? Spradling. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> yeah. had because because what the interviewer asked a question about uh, who was the most impressive winner or who played the most impressive game. Like if it's not you, uh, and of course the name that pops in everybody's mind. Uh, you know, people said Sandra. People said uh, you know a couple other names, but Kim of course came up a lot. See, so yeah, very Rob, this is name. your fault. You yeah. have been hyping up Kim <laughs> for we years. Said the other day it wasn't and my ruining fault. this, ruining no. this for me, no. the number one Kim Stan on earth. If she is out first, I am oh, sending no. a letter to your PO She's box. So nice. <laughs> it's gonna be. I, I really didn't think that would be the case. I really thought that her win was far enough away that people would forget how dominating a performance that she had. So to hear people them, we're just see gonna that. meet her and love but her. So she, like she's gonna stay based on that. And there was also yeah. a lot of talk from the bigger threats that they all are acknowledging the fact that we're big players. We need to stick together. So uh, I do think okay, that there's enough good. of them mm -hmm. that hopefully they will take that and say, all right, I need these people around me. Otherwise. Otherwise, it's going to be game changers where we all go home early and everybody else has a party for the rest of the oh, day. I yeah. know that we're not talking about Tyson tonight, but Tyson's interview was hysterical. Amazing. Yeah. Like, I'm He's just so funny, and I him. don't know why uh, I forget that from time to time. But once he hits that island, he's he just has me cracking up. He's someone that I've actually, like, you know, in re like in the previous weeks sometimes forgot when I was like thinking about people, which is like insane because he's one of my favorites. And I think that that says something like the fact that there's just so many big names that like you can possibly forget Tyson mm -hmm. is just in incredible. And his yeah. yeah, his interview was a must watch. Um, yeah. So good. I, I want to give credit to the uh, interviewer for ET Canada that it was uh, somebody that I was uh, not familiar mm -hmm. with and I, I, that her, her name is uh, Sanjita Patel. And I'm uh, not 100 percent sure that I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I do want to give her credit that she did a really great job. She was job. amazing. Yeah. yeah, like it's great. Like they ET Canada usually sends like a uh, Arissa down there, but Arissa was a I think she was little pregnant. busy at the time. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. they sent down somebody who you could tell she was a big fan. So she did great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I also thought one other takeaway that I had was I was, uh, haven't gotten through all the videos yet, but I was watching Amber do her interview and I thought the on the subject of Sandra and I think a lot of us assumed, okay, well, Rob and Sandra are going to be sort of like joined at the hip, went through season 39 together. Uh, Amber talks about how that like, gee, uh, you know, Rob and I both don't really know how to approach Sandra and we'd be kind of happy if she got voted out there. So for all of us who are assuming, okay, well, Rob and Sandra, that is sort of like an unbreakable pair. Uh, don't necessarily uh, assume it, Brent. Uh, well, I would have definitely assumed that. In fact, I feel like Rob, uh, uh, Boston Rob, like uh, his tentacles get into so many people. Uh, he has, it's like uh, the Kevin Bacon game where, you know, how many people are related to Boston Rob on this cast in some way, shape or form. So I would have thought that Amber and Sandra would have worked together. Maybe. Yeah. 
I, I'm hoping that maybe once they talk, that can change because that would, I, I don't want to see that. I, I would like to see them work together, but that's my preference. It okay. sounds like Rob got scared from spending 39 days in It sounds like <laughs> or, or they she got sick him. of each other. <laughs> He's like, I can't yeah. do this again. Yeah, they're they're like, wait a shoot. second. She's thinking she's, she's, ne- she does not stop. It doesn't, it doesn't stop here. Yeah, so. I'm thinking it's not really that. It's probably more like uh, Sander was maybe a little bit of a diva and he was like, I'm through with her. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I love you, Sander. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's talk about our people that we're going to get into from the two seasons that we're going to talk about. People from season 28 and season 29. And recently, I ranked the 10 years of the last decade based on what were the best years of Survivor. And number one at my list was 2014, where we got to see Survivor Kagian and Survivor San Juan del Sur. And to me, that was when. We first started up Patreon. It was my first season uh, as a full-time podcaster. I love everything Survivor from 2014. And so I'm very excited to have this episode where we're talking about all these people that we got to meet, at least on Survivor. Uh, In the case of Natalie, we met her earlier on The Amazing Race, uh, but we met her as a Survivor in 2014. Okay. But let's start up. Let's talk about Tony first, and then uh, Tony will give way to Sarah, and then we'll talk about Jeremy and Natalie second. But here comes Tony, and uh, Tony's had such an interesting Survivor journey where he had his season in Survivor Kagiyan, season 28, where he was everywhere. And then we had Tony and Game Changers, who was a blip on the radar. But amazingly, it's the same distance away from where we met Tony for one night in Game Changers from now to where Tony played from season 28 to 34, six seasons in between. So every three years, we get to see Tony pop up. And so hopefully this time around, it will be for more than just one night. Matt, did you feel like that Tony that you saw today seem like he might be in a different place than Tony from Game Changers. 100%. Uh, the way that he described his game plan going into this season was he said he doesn't have a plan. He said, I'm not thinking about any strategies. Last time I came in and I said, oh, yeah, I'm going underground. I'm going to take the spy shack and make it a spy bunker. Uh, and, you know, we were all like, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. He had that strategy with his rocks that he had. One's my wife and one's my kid. And I'm going to my give clones. it to people. Clonies. Right. And he was going to those were going to represent his family and he was going to use that to gain trust. He said, it sounds like all that's out the window. And he's going in with just a different mindset of uh I'm going to see what what's out there and just let it play out because uh, I think, you know, for, for a lot of these people, expectations are a little bit lower on them this season. I feel like people aren't going in expecting that they're going to walk out the winner. I don't know if that's a hot take, uh, but I think that it's giving them the ability to loosen up a little bit. And Tony is somebody who needs to loosen up. Haley, were you a fan of Tony 1.0? I was. It's hard to, even if you may not like him as a dude, it's hard to not have been completely entertained by the game he played in his original season, just because it was so off the wall. And I don't think any of us at that time believed that a game like that could win. Uh, We we didn't think that going into the finale, we didn't think when he went up against, what's his name? Weasel Woo. Woo. When he went up against Woo, we didn't think Tony was going to win. I remember sitting in, you know, my friend's apartment out east, like on the edge of my seat because we didn't know who was going to win. And I feel like we haven't had that exciting of a finale in a very long time. And every week we tuned in to see like, what is Tony going to do next? What is he going to do to get himself out of the trouble he put himself in? And it was just one of the most exciting games to watch. And I am excited to see him back for that reason, because I think when he came back for Game Changers, he came back as Tony the character, and that didn't work for him. So I'm hoping he really reverts to, like, Tony the dude and just playing, you know, whatever comes to him, not having pre-planned anything, having, like, ideas going out to the island, just taking things as they are. And I think we could have a lot of fun with Tony again. And I'm hoping that because he didn't do so well in the last season, it could have, like, a boss and Rob effect. And he'll do super well this season. Jenny, how much do you feel like that Tony changed the course of Survivor history with his run in season 28? Uh, In a lot of ways, I feel like Tony is instrumental in saving Survivor. Um, I think that Kagan was such a, like, 
important season in history and um, the way that we talk about it, about it, the way that it's revered, I think it is just, it really reignited, at least I can speak for myself, my excitement in the show. I, you know, I continued watching through the twenties and as we got, you know, into the late twenties, it, it was definitely picking up, but that was like the first season that was just so so incredible and so long that I just could not get enough of. Um, and obviously this is around the time that, you know, like you were talking about with the podcast that like starting to consume media and, you know, be more engaged on Twitter and stuff like that. So I really just feel like, you know, and how Tony was present on social media during that season. Like, I just feel like that was like a turning point in how we consume survivor. Um, and I just think that he's such an important part of survivor history. And I'm so, so excited that we get him back on our TVs and regardless of how his run is going to be, um, you know, be mad at edge of extinction returning, but at least that, ensures there's no way Tony's going home even if he goes to edge of extinction we're going to get multiple episodes of Tony Blockos and that is a gift that we have all earned after the last year of Survivor so <laughs> here, I'm here. thrilled <laughs> I'm thrilled okay. um, and he seems refreshed I like you know Matt kind of touched on it already he's recognized where he went wrong with his approach in Game Changers and um, I think that you know I, I've heard a lot of people talk about Tony as someone who has no shot in in you know this season because of just how you know so how much of an erratic player he is and just the kind of target that he makes on you know and that he's playing with these other you know very adept players but I think that where this differs from Game Changers is like he was one of three winners in Game Changers um, and and a very, very, uh, you know, high profile winner at that. This is a different playing field. And I really I do think that this is a theme that came up in some of the interviews that there is going to there are going to be people that see themselves as the big fish that band together to protect each other and kind of go after um some of you know the the lesser known threats that that they feel like might need to prove something so i actually don't feel terrible about tony's chances in this season and seeing him be like verbalize how he's feeling about the game really made me feel a lot better about it today too. Yeah. Uh, honestly, that makes me feel so much better to hear somebody else say that because tales of Tony's incompetence have been greatly exaggerated across the RHAP universe. I listened to the survivor 40 preseason draft that Mike yeah. Bloom and Ali Lasher and Akiva and, Akiva and Liana Boris Liana, did. Yeah. And they were like making a joke of Tony. Like not only did he go 20 in that out of 20 people in that, that draft but then they Shame. gave liana the option to who liana had the 20th draft selection they gave her the option to not even select tony to select people who may have been cast on the were show wrong. who yeah. were not even there so put like, some respect I, on his name. <laughs> I understand exactly put some respect on his name I, the thing that people don't understand about tony is that tony and game changers he forgot the girl that brought him to the dance okay because he was an absolute buffoon in game changers and that is not how he played on the his original season people remember the kooky stuff and the who who like they remember in the llama talking and all that. They uh, you mean okay. this? this is huge. Yeah. <laughs> I needed this. Ooh. This is Tony Ooh. talking about uh, Brent uh, <laughs> praising him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, but seriously, he had a lot of great tools that he used during Kageyan because he was he was sympathetic he was empathetic he was heartfelt when he needed to be he was serious when he needed to be and most of all for people who think that he was a complete joke you just need to to be dissuaded from that you need to look at the final tribal council performance in Kageyan where he really had to get serious for a second when Trish came to him and said look you swore on your father's grave mm -hmm. to me and I need to know was it worth it to you for a million dollars to defile the memory of your father and he starts to give a bunch of excuses and she's like no i want the truth and he's like and she's like was it worth it for a million dollars to soil your father's memory answer yes or no and he looks at her without a beat and goes yes and I, like to me i'm like oh my god like write him the check right now so if he can just bottle a little bit of that on this season with all of these crazy egos around him 
I really feel like he's got a shot to win this thing. Yeah. It, it's so interesting that we've had the, the two Tonys, not the clones, but we've had the Tony who is literally and figuratively unstoppable where he, uh, and he has that. He's got a bag of tricks and in that bag of tricks is an idol where you can't even vote him out. And then Haley, we saw the very mortal Tony where he gets struck down on the very first night of the show. He ends up being the, the second boot he's covering. He's, he's buried himself. Uh, nobody, everybody is seeing through the what spy grave. <laughs> what he's up to uh, that he flew too close to the sun came all the way back down to earth. But now we have a chance to view this uh, third iteration of Tony. And, and do you think that he is going to be seen as, okay, this is the unstoppable force or is he, as they mention on the draft podcast, is this, is this the clown? Is, is this the person who they, you don't take Tony seriously? I just worry that people will find him unpredictable and unpredictability is a really scary thing in the game of survivor. And so, so why, why play with fire? And, uh, you know, so I could see Tony going out for that reason pretty early. Um, but I'm hoping he, he humbled himself from his last play and can kind of go back to that ba back to basics. Jenny, can Tony chill out? Can Tony not be crazy Tony? I mean, he seemed chilled out in his interview, the ET Canada interview. Nobody needs to go back and watch the Game Changers preseason interview. Yeah, and yeah, that was like, uh, yeah. I'm so relaxed now. Well, he was <laughs> no, he, he seemed like he was ready to go in that in that interview. He definitely did seem um, you know, more relaxed and and some of the answers he gave like really impressed me and just the way that he talked about, you know, what he learned from his second time out and how he needs to change his game plan. And um, just the way that he talks, talked about his strategy and, and what to change. That was all really great. But I also know that Tony is the kind of like Tony can't not be Tony. And mm -hmm. he was even, even talking about, um, you know, his family. He was like, Oh, ask me in a couple. He's like, I'm okay right now. But like, you know, ask me the same cause I'm getting ready for the game. Like ask me again in a few days and I might be like, you know, pent up. And I think that that goes for more than just talking about his family. I think that it's one of those things where it's easy to say in the pregame when, you know, things haven't gotten real yet that you're going to play a, a certain way. And I, I, I will always have concerns about Tony not being able to not be extra. Um, but he's saying all the right things and I can see a lot of scenarios where things don't go as poorly for him as you would think they would. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to remain hopeful. I really, I'm holding on to, um, and like this will be a theme of of how I talk about all four of the uh, the people we're discussing tonight. That I see a scenario where some of these big names um, are really you know using each other as as meat shields. Yes. And I think that even though it was six seasons ago, Game Changers is still going to be present in everyone's minds, and they're going to say, "Remember that roster?" And you know. No, no, well, maybe a little shade on, you know, uh, Brad and Troyzan and Sarah as the final three, but people were scratching their heads being like, how did this happen? And I think that that is something that's going to be, you know, still present in the minds of, of the season 40, um, you know, winners that they're not going to want to get bested by someone that they feel like played a lesser game. And, and so I really think that we could see someone like Tony thriving here. Um, yeah, just really quickly. And I see this in the comments section too. of the chat is like, people are like, I'm really worried that Tony can't not be Tony. And I heard Mike Bloom say that on the preseason season podcast he's like that's just him that's in his blood and i'm like did y'all forget that he's a cop like did y'all forget that that was his job when he was on kageyam with that even though he was actually I thought he was crazy a construction and... worker Brent. <laughs> oh i, I of, for, course. For a few yes, that too, of course <laughs> but my point being that he like this is not him in real life like he can actually be serious and for a, like the first you know 50 percent of that game i feel like he really was serious and taken seriously by his tribe to the point where they looked at him like a leader they looked at mm. him some like someone who we can depend on and trust now i feel like he has it within him 
to act like that, to act more like that. Like, do here's the thing. Do the people on the island know what they think is the real Tony? Tony, do they perceive that? Certainly. But I feel like he can change their mind and say, look, I'm an older guy now. You know, I've lost a step or two and I'm chill now. It's cool. And I, they've got so many other threats yeah. around them. Are they really going to worry about Tony? I think not. I, I do think that Tony, I could see him coming out of there like, oh, uh, you know, I, I lost I lost a step. Did you see Game Changers? I suck now. You know, I'm, that, uh, you know, I'm not as good as you. I'm not as good as these young guys. So I, I definitely see Tony really heavily pouring on the I suck now card uh, and trying to convince people. But Matt, when we talk about this idea of meat shields is that counterintuitive that the, the more that tony sort of like walks around with his like uh shoulder slumped and like oh i suck now i'm not as good as i used to be i'm not like any of these young guys so is it possible that it does that is that the opposite way of that tony should be going if people like we saw jeremy in his interviews talking about how hey i i gotta keep tony around i need guys like that out in front of me so I don't want to scare you because I know that you're a big Tony guy, but I kind of feel like if Tony is used in that way uh, as a meat shield for some of the other bigger players, I feel like there's big potential there that that could turn into him ending up as a goat that people carry to the end. And I know that might sound crazy uh, at first, but there was a lot of Tony comparisons when he first played to this guy somewhat like Russell. You know, it, it, there was, um, it, it obviously like as his game played out, that kind of disappeared a little bit that you saw the separation between the two of them. But if there is that kind of like negative vibe towards Tony, you don't feel great about him. You feel a little bit icky after you're done playing a season with him. Uh, once you get towards like the halfway point in the game, you're not worried about Tony and immunity challenges. Like a lot of these are all balance and and you know holding the thing above your head is tony beating you in that probably not so at a certain point i might be looking at someone like tony like i wouldn't mind sitting next to him at the end because i yeah. feel like i'm more likable than him and i could get the votes I, there's not I a lot of go tony only has one challenge win he won the cover yourself in mud reward and won a slice of pizza or a couple slices of pizza uh that he got to eat with trish that is the only challenge win yeah uh, yeah he talks about he wanting in his interview he talks about wanting Wanting to finally get an individual immunity win. So, yeah. I mean, it's not something we've seen uh, yet. But, so if I'm uh, Kim, if I'm Parvati, if I'm any of these like likable people and I'm at the final nine with Tony, why do I want to get rid of him at this point? Yeah. Well, where do I sign on the dotted line for Tony in the <laughs> final three? How do, how do I, <laughs> I know, right? do that? But I'll then you it, also, like I can see, like, I can see the argument when it's like Tony's in the final three and it's like, it's freaking Tony. Like you let Tony get to the final. That's three. what I was going to say. Like so, when, when, when Rob was know. asking Matt about like, you know, if Tony acts a certain way, is that the opposite of the way he needs to act? I'm like, it's still Tony freaking Blockos. Like, I mean, I feel like he's one of the top five people in this cast who you really know, like first name, like, you know who he is. He, he, he commands respect. Even if you don't respect him on the Island, like his, the, the idea and the game he played in, in Kageyan, it, it commands respect to a certain extent, or at least a little bit of fear in some of these people, a fear of the unknown. So I have to imagine that there's no way he's going to end up as a goat, Matt. Haley, what do you make of this? Uh, which, which way do you see this and end, ending up going for Tony? You know, as a stereotypical Libra, I can see it going both ways. Absolutely. Same. 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 Yeah. <laughs> the Jenny, do you, have, do you have the astrological readings for all the people? That I we're do. Of course okay, I do. All right, yeah, we'll, get, do. We'll, get, all right, we'll get that at the end for each <laughs> Excellent. person. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> I could... Oh, gosh. I have to make a decision, eh? You're going mm -hmm. to force me to do it. <laughs> hmm. I think he'll be out pre-merge. Mm-hmm. But God, it would be fun to see him last longer than that. Yeah. And are they going to find out about Edge of Extinction early on? Because that could influence no. this. If they, I, I don't want to live with Tony on the Edge of Extinction. Oh. <laughs> Can you well, imagine? My, my understanding was <laughs> that's not what they, I want. They, I, I was told that uh, I was reading today that a few of them talked about it in their interviews, and that like I think they told them this before. They speculated. They didn't yeah. know. Sandra. Thought, Sandra said she's Probe like I think said. I thought Probe said in his interview with Dalton, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that they wanted to guarantee the winners a chance, like an honest oh, maybe, chance yeah. at the game. Yeah. And so they went that with that distinction. I took that to mean that, that, that everybody knew about it. So, so. I don't know if they're going to know if they know about it yet in the preseason, but the way that it seems like it's structured where you have fire tokens and you're exchanging fire tokens with people on the edge of extinction. Fire that, tokens? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that I think that if they, if they do not know, 
yet. I think they will know almost immediately as soon as uh, you know the first person is voted out, and there's sort of like this opportunity to right. say this uh, trading between the people on the edge of extinction and the people that are still in the game. Okay. Yep. So. Right. We'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see where it goes. Let's talk about some friends for Tony that might be out there. Of course, that's somebody who we're going to talk about in a greater detail, who this is the the relationship to watch. Sarah Lucina is there. And so, Jenny, this is very interesting, I think, that we're talking about, like, can Tony stay under control? That can Tony not, not fly off the handle? That I, having Sarah out there, this does feel like that, okay, that he has now a, a, a partner on the beat to say, like, Tony, you got to calm down. You're getting out of control. You're getting too crazy. Well, I mean, I've seen lots of people ask, like, who's who's going to be Tony's Trish? Um, and, and that, you know, Trish playing such a huge part in, in Tony's, uh, you know, stellar game in Kagayan. And I think that this is what we've been waiting for is seeing uh, finally seeing Tony and Sarah actually work together and have it work. And I mm -hmm. think that... Um, this cops is the are us. Now, cops are us like, you know, version, I guess I, this is 2.0 since they <laughs> didn't really get to connect in game changers. But I think that this is the perfect timing because Tony's calmed down. He's humbled himself and and Sarah's gotten her win. And so there's, you know, she doesn't have a chip on her shoulder anymore because she got to play the game that she knew she was capable of in game changers, got her win. And the way that Sarah talks about Tony post all of this is, um, you know, she's got a love, a lot of love for Tony. And I, I think that that love goes right back to, um, to Sarah. And Sarah. I think that they know that they're not, I don't think either of them are super socially connected in the community. I don't think that either of them are, you know, big event people. Um, I think that they kind of, you know, play survivor and then they get back to their normal lives. Mm -hmm. And so I think that they are smart enough to recognize that, you know, they need each other in this game. So I, and, and Sarah is very level, level headed, very calm. Um, and you know, we might see Sarah finally be, uh, you know, Trish 2.0 for, for Tony and, and be the grounding, uh, presence for his crazy. Um, and I'd love to see it. Like, I think it would be really interesting to see them finally, um, you know, the buddy cop, uh, storyline that we've really wanted or some of us have wanted. I'm, I'm excited for it. Haley, but do you feel like that while Sarah could be a calming presence for Tony, is that actually a bigger target? Like if, if uh, Sarah and Tony are not working together, that Tony might be better off. But the fact that if people start seeing the two of them together, is, is that a bigger potential problem for uh, one or both of them? Yes, probably. But like, are we sure that Sarah wants to be partnered up with Tony again? Like, I feel like she's been burned by Emma before. Yeah. She said, well, well, we'll get to Sarah and talk about a game changer. But, but that, that is a great point that Sarah is, you know, one who does not ever seem to mind losing an ally here or there that to try to, you know, uh, keep her threat level lower. Uh, boy, uh, Brent, is it, could you see Sarah throwing Tony under the bus? Oh, yeah. I can see Sarah uh, throwing Tony under the bus. I can see a variety of different people throwing uh, Tony under the bus, including some of the more alpha guys. I mean, I know what Jeremy said in his uh, ET Canada interview, Matt, but I still feel like that of the people there who might be most irritated or threatened by Tony, it would be some of the more alpha guys. If you look back at Kagiyan and where Tony really thrived, it was surrounding himself with women and young guys. So I feel like if Tony can cobble together people like that he might have more of a chance but like uh some of these alpha guys or even some of these uh yeah. more, he didn't love uh, lj yeah uh, that's true that's true yeah he, he didn't like lj and he didn't like Cliff. so uh, he got rid of the two older guys i mean uh, to me of those people i felt of those people in kagiyan i felt like lj was more of an elder statesman mm -hmm. compared to like you know spencer and Wu. so yeah uh, you know uh take it yeah. take it for what you will okay matt who else are allies for tony that are in this game potentially your guess is as good as mine. I, there's nobody. There's no other natural allies for him. Okay. There's nobody else that that I think is this is a clear person that he should work with that he can work with. But I think like uh, we've been saying, I guess uh, he is somebody that is the perfect person for anybody else that needs uh, needs that extra person to go pick up. But there, I, I don't see any other like natural fits. Well, let me throw out. How about Sandra? Now they did not get along in Game Changers, but they both went on that pre-jury nope. trip together, and I do feel like that that's the kind of thing where you know I. I would 
always think about this with a uh, Suri and Tom Westman, where they both went after each other in heroes versus villains. And then the two of them at Ponderosa sat there and said, we should have worked together. What are we, this was crazy. Why were you coming after me and me coming after you that we could have, we could have done something. And they spent a lot of time together outside of the game. And I, I really think that they seemed like they had a mutual respect for each other. Jenny, is that possible? Could we see Tony working with Sandra? I thought about it because for, for the reasons that you've mentioned, but I think that there's just a very big difference in the example that you gave and Tony yeah, and Sandra. Like, like I just think that there's so much ego there and that they're both the kind of person where it's like, if we didn't work to, if I couldn't work with you before, it's not going to happen he now. Calls her the queen now. I, I think he that he feels that way. I, absolutely. But that doesn't. Sandra is the queen. Does he want to lose to, to Sandra? Like, you know what I mean? Like, is that what he really wants? Um, and I I just I almost think that Tony would be more interested in it than Sandra. Oh, definitely I, that. Like, yeah. So I think I could see Tony being okay with it, but I could also see Sandra just being like, I don't have time for this. Yeah, I don't I, I in the scenario or the analogy that you proposed, Rob, like it was Sari and Tom, both who finished finished like third and fourth on or fourth and fifth on their seasons in Heroes versus Villains. Uh you know, with the uh, game changers, Tony went out like with second and Sandra only went out because she got swap screwed. So yeah. I, and I, I really, really yeah. I, I feel like Sandra's like, I didn't do nothing wrong. I got rid of him when I was supposed to, and I just got a bad swap. What do you mm -hmm. want? You could also say that, like, you know, th those two needing to work, like looking back and being like, we should have worked together is a totally different point in Game Changers than this season, where they were two of the only three winners playing in Game Changers. Um, it's a lot easier to say, like, we were going to be targets. We should have been keeping each other around as long as possible. Um, when you're playing a season with all winners and there's some really heavy hitters, I just don't think that that argument really applies the same way that it would with game changers. And I just cannot, I, I cannot see, I really loved what Shannon said um, the other night about, uh, you know, Sandra lining up people. If she can't yeah. win, she would rather have these sorts of people <laughs> be successful in the game. I, and I just never see Tony being one of those people. So I just, I think as much as Tony might be open to it, I just don't see it being a mutually felt uh, relationship. Okay. Haley, do you see any people on the board that are major ops for Tony that are going to be uh, coming in saying, Hey, got to get Tony out first, second, as soon as possible. Yeah, I'd say there's probably a couple, starting with Amber, Danny, Denise, Kim, Michelle, <laughs> Natalie, Parvati, Sandra, Sarah, Sophie, Adam, Ben, Ethan, Jeremy, Nick, Rob, Tony. Tony's trying to get himself out. Tyson, Wendell, and Yule. <laughs> wow. Coming in hot. Well, you would have fit in really well on that uh, Survivor 40 preseason draft podcast. Because, uh, <laughs> like, uh... No, it's just, it's, it's just a joke. Uh, some true adversaries, I think, I think Rob doesn't like that type yeah. of guy who's unpredictable. Um, uh, I could see Yule going either way with him. Yeah, I could see Boston Rob not loving Tony. Um, yeah, I, def I, def I definitely could see that. I can see Tyson loving Tony as like a comedic character in front of him, like as entertainment mm -hmm. on the island, but I don't think he ever wants to work with them. Ethan, I just don't like... <laughs> Ethan's a nice guy, but I don't think they're going to mesh. Like, it's just a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, looking through this like, Natalie and Tony. Are, like, I don't know if those two strong personalities are going to go well together. I think she likes uh, Natalie yeah. does. I, I believe like I, I, I don't know if they've spent any time in in real life. But when it was rumored that Natalie was going to be on Game Changers that I feel like that she talked about uh, that. I remember in doing because they again, these are people that played back to back and uh, that she uh, gave Tony a lot of credit that she had seen Tony's season right before they played in San Juan del Sur. But there's a difference it, between giving somebody credit and like playing the game with them, especially when Natalie wants to be Queen Bee. Yeah, they're both from uh, like blue collar people Jersey. from Jersey. Like they, uh, they Half have this some cast connections. is from Jersey. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot Th of that's North good. East. That's good. That's good. No, that Survivor was, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> that was one thing I I I took away from I uh, listened to Natalie um, La Natalie's interview with you during Game Changers, and she talked about um, how she was almost on the season and how she would have played. And we'll talk about this more, but she did know that like, I would have been working with Tony and Sandra like. 
bringing together the, you know, the big targets and, and, you know, going after the smaller people. Mm. But again, same point I just made, that is a totally different story in Game Changers when those three are, you know, in her mind, she, she didn't mention JT at all. Um, yeah. I still feel that, like though, those I, were the I, winners. I take your point, Jenny, but I, I still feel like that there's enough, uh, chafe in this cast that uh, even though they are winners, there's plenty of people here who we don't really care a lot about and nobody really cares a lot about, but Tony is somebody you care about and Sandra is somebody you care about. And I yeah. feel like, like they should know that they should work together. Yeah, I know. I agree. And we I like, so. I hope do so. they know yeah. they can work together, but like, sure. But can they work together? Can <laughs> they just push everything aside once they're on the island or will they get at each other's throats? I feel and like I it's more on Tony. If Tony comes uh, mm -hmm. with the, uh, you know, uh, Hat and olive branch, then yeah. 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 If he can sure, tone, but, tone but if it Sandra down. gets annoyed by him, like Sandra can flip like that. Yeah. Uh, I'd be scared know. of Sandra if I were Tony. That's okay. That's uh, let's let, let's talk our uh, let, let's give a ballpark of where we think Tony's going. Brent, you seem like you're the highest on Tony on the panel, at least from Kagi on. Yep. You feel like that uh, Tony has a, a shot, maybe? I, I feel like he has a shot, and I feel like he clearly makes the merge. My opinion on Tony. Yes. And actually, now, Matt, you you almost sound like that maybe he could go far but not win. That's I, I don't think Tony can win again. I think uh, we, we call his win like he was the unicorn, and I feel like that's for a reason. I don't think it can happen again, but I do think he can stick around uh, longer this time than he did last time, and uh, definitely hoping for that. Uh, but That yeah, isn't I, hard. I, I don't, <laughs> yeah, I just don't think he can win again. I don't. Okay. Haley... It sounds like you think he's out very early. Yeah, yeah. I think I think so. I, I would love to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Haley, I feel like you you're forgetting like what Sheehan said in All Stars about Richard Hatch. Like no one wants to see the king dead. Like that would be that's no fun. Like yeah, there's a lot of them. kings here. There's a lot of kings and there's a lot of queens. Yeah, it's not like, like All Stars where there's I, a few of them. Like everyone I, here is like. I still feel like Tony commands that respect with them. Like, even, like I said, it may not be a respect like the way we think of it, but at least like a, a certain level of fear. Like, you know, I want to give him his due. But we'll mm -hmm. see. Maybe it's just wishful thinking on my part. Uh, in terms of giving him his due, I do uh, think that when, when we look at sort of like we'll, we'll talk about on Monday night, you know, uh, the people that are like the the people that played after Tony and what they think of him. I do think, again, like when we talk about like the Adams and Nick's and maybe even like uh, Wendell, uh, do they have like a reverence for Tony? Would they be not so quick to vote Tony out? Like, oh, I got to I got to see what this guy is going to do next. I want to keep him around. I can just see Adam like, you know, I, I feel like Adam is really the kind of person that, you know, he's a, he's a fanboy of the game, even though he's he's one, you know, he has just as much right to be there as anyone mm -hmm. else. I still think that there's, you know, something about him where he's going to be like, yo, I'm playing with freaking Tony Vlacos like this is incredible. Right. And I, I think that it's, you know say what you will about Tony, whether he's your favorite person or not, or, you know, his gameplay was your favorite. He is a character and he is, you know, I just think that there will be people that get wrapped up in just the presence of him. And, um, I can see someone like, like an Adam possibly wanting to work with him yeah. just because it's like, I've always wanted to like work with this person and, you know, I'll figure out, how I beat him later, but for now I want this guy, I want this guy in my corner. And so I definitely think that he could have more friends than people are thinking that he would going in. Yeah. W Wendell, Nick, Ben, those are, I feel like ideal allies for Tony at this point. And he just needs to pray that a couple of them are on his tribe. Yeah. So I really came into this feeling like, uh, where I, I was where Haley was like, uh, Tony's probably the first one out, at least there's the edge of extinction. But I have to say, I'm starting to warm to Tony. I, I don't think he can win. Uh, I, I don't think people are going to let him, uh, get that far. But I do feel like that people will say like, OK, well, as long as Tony is around, I'm not going to be in trouble. But then eventually, you know, when he shows up with an idol or he's out idol hunting eventually or he's gone for like, where is Tony? Is he hiding in the bushes again? I think eventually that he can't not be Tony. And I think that's going to eventually be too big of a threat and they're going to send him uh, out of the game. But I, I do think he'll, he'll be around for a while. He's impossible to forget about. You just there will never be a point where you forget that Tony is there like you will with maybe a bunch of the others. Which so I feel like works in favor of other people who have really big egos and are mm -hmm. scared to death that they're going to be betrayed yeah. by somebody. Keeping somebody around like Tony is ideal for them. 
Yeah. You know, it's interesting because when Tony went to go play in Survivor Game Changers, the the people on Game Changers, they had not they had not seen Millennials versus Gen X. Or I don't know, they had not seen that much of it where Adam, you know, felt uh, part of Adam's game was I'm going to keep the threats out in front of me. Jeremy uh, played that way in Cambodia, but I don't know how much that was really talked about yet in terms of what his strategy was. And I do think that as the 30s has gone along, more and more people have uh, played with this idea of I need to keep the threats out in front and now maybe that strategy has caught up to a point where tony can actually benefit from this idea of being that person who other players put out in front of them so that they end up uh being able to hide behind some of these bigger targets in the game so we'll see uh if tony can benefit and from that but let's one, one yes. sorry one last thing real quick uh one of the other things that he said in his interview was that he isn't all about like the whole like Basically calling out the people who go on Survivor these days and try to yes. be like influencers or kind who of. Who is he just, talking about? I don't know, but it, it felt pretty targeted at the newer players, like the yeah. people who are just all over who? social media. I, I don't know. Michelle, Wendell, like people who are oh. popping up all over the place kind of thing. Uh, so I yeah, don't know that, if he's going to be working as closely with the new players. I yeah, feel like so he might just gravitate towards the old He was like, uh, you know, we, we're contestants. We're, we're, we're not celebrities. So yeah. It's like the uh, price is right. But and I also <laughs> think... Sorry, go on, Rob. No, and uh, Sanjita uh, had said to him, like, well, who? Who are you talking about? Yeah. He's like, yeah, uh, he go, on YouTube. go on YouTube. <laughs> go on YouTube. Go on YouTube. Which, yeah, no, but who's on YouTube? <laughs> so Is he's got me? his eye on people you. that he's I think not loving. I think he's talking about yeah, you. Yeah, I think he thinks you're on the cast, Rob. That's what ha <laughs> yeah. that's what's happening. Rock and Rob. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think he was necessarily saying about people that are on the cast. I thought he was just saying survivors in general. Yeah, um, he might not have I, even I been felt a little bit about winners. Maybe, yeah. maybe. I, I felt like he was maybe talking a little bit about people who just pop up at all these events and think that they're celebrities because they, you know, go everywhere and people want to take pictures with them kind of thing. Oh, he's talking about Adam and Sandra and Rob. Oh, so, maybe. Yeah. He also <laughs> said that uh, one of his pet peeves was know-it-alls. And now I've always been I had nothing but love for Tony. <laughs> I have to think he was talking about Steven. There was shaded fish bag. Yeah, Come on. Nick couple. said that too. And Nick was yeah, a Nick, patron. Yeah, Nick mentioned know-it-alls. Yeah. Uh, so there was, a, there was a few mentions. Maybe some people actually just me know it all so like they, they are annoying right you might need to rebrand rob <laughs> this is this is getting a little too murky mm -hmm. okay a little too murky all right but jenny before we can move on from tony will you promise that you would give us the uh astrological <laughs> sign so, for tony what, what what's how is it looking for tony okay well i'm not gonna get into it and i'm gonna piss off a ton of people because i know that some of these some people don't like astrology tony so it's more complicated than just your sun sign tony is a virgo virgos are very detail oriented they can they're they're kind of seen as like the anal sign um Whoa! You're, you're <laughs> they're very Who knew? Who knew? They're organized. They have they have really keen eye. They're they, they can they're kind of like the mom or the dad sign. Like they're they're in charge. Um, I think that him as a police officer as a Virgo makes a lot of, a lot of sense. The way that he was able to find idols, um, that makes a lot of sense as a Virgo. Um, just they're they're very type a and like to do things their way they're the people that are standing in the corner watching you do something and being like you're doing it wrong um mm -hmm. anyway so that's what tony but tony's definitely got some some other wild stuff happening in his chart for sure but he, like tony is i believe his birthday might be september 10th or something around then um he's a virgo hey, that's nicole's birthday i was gonna say yeah he's right around nicole yeah. Uh, they're very similar. That's why Nicole's I that's, definitely I'm a Virgo. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, okay. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> let actually let's uh, take a, a quick uh, break from talking about uh, meat shields to talking about meat. Uh, and those, that's because this podcast is sponsored by our friends over at Butcher Box. Uh, Butcher Box is a uh, great a great thing for people because if you want to spend less time and money at the grocery store and eat better, you can now with butcher box. Uh, you don't need no fire tokens to get high quality meats sent to your house. Butcher box is the meat delivery subscription that is going to give you more time for what matters most each month. They're going to send you a box of the highest quality meat for a better price than at the grocery store, which is going to give you more time to spend cooking and sharing delicious meals with your family and friends. Each month, butcher box is going to ship you a curated selection of high quality meat 
right to your home. It's all free of antibiotics and added hormones. Each box has nine to 11 pounds of meat, enough for 24 individual meals. That's more than if you were going to have a meal for every survivor this season, packed fresh and ship frozen vacuum seal. So it stays that way. You can customize your box or go with one of theirs. It's exactly what you want. We got to try this out and they sent us a whole big crate of stuff over to the house. You throw it right in the freezer. Uh, it's ready to go when you need it. Uh, Butcher Box is the most affordable and convenient way to get healthy, humanely raised meat. With Butcher Box, you get the highest quality meat around for just $6 a meal, and they have free shipping in the United States, except for to Alaska and Hawaii. Right now, you can get two pounds of salmon absolutely free. That's like having uh, Rupert right there in your backyard, uh, plus $20 <laughs> off your first box. Just go to butcherbox.com slash RHAP. Use promo code RHAP at checkout. That's butcherbox.com slash RHAP or use promo code RHAP at checkout. Great deal with Butcher Box. Okay, let's talk about Tony's partner in crime, maybe? Let's talk about a little more about Sa Sarah. Sarah, oh, uh, Brent, she came off of winning in Game Changers. And Sarah is such an interesting person to talk about, I think, because she came into Game Changers super low profile. No, then she was one of the people that's like, and, and who else is? Uh, oh, Sarah is on the cast. OK, uh, nobody was concerned about her. She was able to stay under the radar, made big moves left and right, switching back and uh, back and forth voting out her allies, taking the legacy advantage from Sierra Don Thomas, voting out all these different people that she worked with. She gives her wedding ring to, uh, or, or, or she, what would she take? She took Brad Culpepper's wedding ring. Yeah. She gave her bracelet. It was like a bicycle spoke bracelet. Yeah, she didn't care about it. Uh, <laughs> and then here she is. She wins. Brent, are people going to lose track of Sarah Lucina again? Or is her profile too big after coming off of Game Changers? No, her profile is definitely not too big. Not with the caliber of players that we have on this season. It, there's just no way it can be. Uh, I think that it's so, far more likely that they forget about her. And yes, she played an amazing game on Game Changers, but a lot of people don't really like that season. And it's sort of like, yeah, she won, but she was up there against Troy Zan and Culpepper. So I really don't think they're going to give her a lot of credit, even though they probably should. And I honestly feel like her fate in this game is polar opposites. It's either she's going to be one of the first boots because she doesn't really have uh, any ties with anybody and people see her as expendable and not to worry about. Plus, they think it'll make the, the fans happy, which I actually do think is a little part of some of their thinking. Or she will slide through to the merge and make her way to the end. I actually don't think she can win again, mainly because I feel like she's somewhat unlikable to some of the people in this cast. But we'll see. But nevertheless, I still feel like that her game is uh, it's a high risk, high reward at this point. That's how I feel with Sarah. Okay. Haley, what do you make of Sarah and her threat level coming in? Uh, I feel like her threat level is higher than her perceived threat level. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone's going to be thinking of her going into the game. I don't think anyone's going to be thinking about her until after the merge. She's going to put her head down. She's going to work at camp. She's going to do okay in challenges. And she's going to be like not so great socially that she scares people but not mm -hmm. bad socially like i think people forget that people like sarah in game yeah and that's why she got so far um and i, well, remember I think that's a good that's a good point if we could just uh dive into sure. that a little bit more because that sarah had done i know that uh and brent's made the point that they're saying that people don't like sarah but i actually i don't think that's the case that she does not come across on TV as somebody that you think of uh, like, like when you watch Kim on TV, like, uh, like Kim seems very likable and you understand. And then everybody else that's around her also likes her. But with Sarah, that everybody that played with her in game changers. And I get to talk to all these people when they come off the game, they all talked about how like, Oh, I th you know, thought Sarah was my best friend and Sarah and I was really close and everybody had these great relationships with Sarah. There's almost nobody that came off the show and was like, oh, I hated Sarah the whole time. Uh, Sarah was the worst, but then it doesn't necessarily translate to the TV show. Haley. I, I completely agree. Like, I don't think anyone's going to consider her an exciting character, especially when, 
Tony is on screen next to her. Um, but any of the people she burned in Game Changers, they're not here to tell the other people that they got burned. I think Tony burned Sarah before she could burn him. And so she, he's not he's not super afraid of her or anything. I don't think anyone's going to be afraid of her. I think there are a lot of bigger targets on the board that are going to go before you, they even think of her. And I could absolutely see her ending up in the final three again and people going like, Darn! I guess we should have gotten <laughs> her out, but like we happen? forgot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Jenny, do you have uh, thoughts on Sarah 3.0? She played an incredibly impressive game in in Game Changers, and I do think that you know people just really don't like that season, and that is is has an impact on how her win is viewed because I think people like in a vacuum, I think it's just she just played such an impressive game, and she is a very worthy winner and. Um, so I think that that the fact that that is not a well-regarded season in general helps downplay her threat, even though her actual game was very impressive. Um, the problem is, is there, there are various people in this cast that I feel like have something to them and the way that they play the game that they put them in any season in with any people around them and they they can do well playing that same sort of style of game. Sarah Sarah's second game was so reliant on how she was perceived going into that into that second mm -hmm. game and people not really getting to see what she was capable of in Kagayan and and being bested by Tony. Um and so much of her game relied on, upon everyone feeling like they like she, they were her number one and I think that once you see someone play that way the jig's kind of up and I just think that like she's not playing with any chumps like these are all winners they obviously have done their homework and I think that no one is going to get fooled by thinking oh I'm like you know Sarah and I are talking about this and like I really feel like she's like my best friend out here because that's exactly how she got the win in game changers. So I just, I do worry that this is the kind of, she can't replicate that same game. So she's going to have to do something different if she wants to go far. And I, I, as much as I, I do feel like she has excellent game potential in her. I just don't know that she can pull it off again and that she might be one of these people that gets picked off early. Yeah. Matt. Yeah. It, Go uh, go, uh, that I was going to just uh, mention that Matt, the, it's interesting about Sarah being seen as somebody who's a backstabber because that's what she had to do so much in Game Changers to be able to win. And it was a uh, incredible win that she had. But there were so many people that were close to her, you know, especially the one that stands out, I think, the most is the Sierra Dawn Thomas with the legacy advantage of, OK, I'm going to uh, that. OK, so she told me she would give me the legacy advantage. So now I have to get her voted out so many of these winners didn't have to backstab to get the win that so many of the winners were able to sort of get to the 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 finals and be able to have done it where it wasn't like that they took out all these other people that were their friends along the way that do you think that that reputation is something that you could shake in a season like this I don't see Sarah playing this season anything like she played the last one. I think the version of Sarah from Kagayan is way more likely to come out here where she kind of maybe feels like she has a grasp on the game and it kind of completely falls apart once she finds her. Because I do see her as somebody who could go either way. I think she could go with the new players or she could try to go with the old players and she might find herself in that middle position again where she thinks that she is the swing vote, ends up not being the swing vote. There was uh, a little bit of talk about how uh, I, I think... I no, Parvati definitely mentioned it, but if there are any of these other winners out there who haven't been paying full attention uh, to the most recent seasons, but maybe you're catching up a little bit or just refreshing themselves on some of the recent stuff, especially because they want to see, you know, some of the recent twists and whatnot, and they see Sarah, they're going in with, uh, this is one of the best players of this new crop of players. Uh, you know, she dominated her season, uh, super impressive. I do think that she could very easily stand out uh, amongst that group. And I also have to agree, uh, I don't know, I don't remember who specifically might have said it, but I do not find Sarah very likable. I think uh, she, in her pregame interview, the the, uh, the one that we just you know got today from ET Canada, um, she if there were some people I saw after Tommy's recent interview with you talking about Tommy's really high on his game, huh? He really liked uh, yeah. what he did out there. Sarah, uh, check out her interview. She was she very, was not humbled like Tony. 
she was very high on the game that she played. Uh, I was one of the best winners. I played a masterful game. And if she brings that energy with her to the island, it's going to be off-putting to everybody else on top of the fact that uh, she's just not somebody that is your top pick to work with. So there, there's signs all over the place that I feel like there are going to be people like Parvati or like some of the old school players who are like, you know what? There's nothing that's going to happen here with me and Sarah. Uh, it's She's a good person to get out. Yeah, I, I agree with that, actually, too. Uh, something, you know, I keep it real with you guys. And so, like, something to think about that people on the island might be thinking about as well is that Sarah Lucina is a somewhat vocal supporter of the president of the United States. And I know that there are people on the island who care about that sort of thing. And I'm not projecting my thoughts onto the island about what I want to happen. But I certainly think it's not outside the realm of possibility that they will look at her and go, you know what? Let's just get rid of her first, because you know, who cares? Uh, I, I, I understand that, uh, that, you know, in terms of like the, like people's politics, that yeah. first of one, I think it's more likely to like the people that, uh, share her political views would be more likely to work with her. But in there terms are, of, there are that as well, in terms of voting somebody out because of that, that I, I just, I, I people are going to do what's best for them. I don't think that people are going to, you know, I'm going to vote out this person. I agree. Of, and I'm, I'm going to make a political statement. Me. They're like, no politics, Brent. I'm not trying to bring politics into it. I'm just keeping it real with you guys that, that it, I feel like we're in a really polarizing environment right now. And so, there may be people on the Island with an ax to grind. That's what I'm saying. And I'm giving you the tea. Yeah. I said, she's unlikable. There's a lot of reasons why, but yep. you know that if you go back to her last, I mean, uh, she won a season, uh, during the Trump presidency. So yeah. I, I did, it, it did, didn't seem to hold her back last I time. I feel like that was a different Sarah than they didn't really know much about her, but we'll uh, see. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't think anybody's <laughs> politics are going to have uh, a bearing. I, I would Let's be very not. surprised. I'd be very surprised if a any of the players uh, talk a lot about politics on the Island, because it seems like a, a good way to, you know, lose half your allies uh, at any given point. Very true. Yeah. I, th I think one thing about Sarah is that, um, there's something about like her tone of voice where it's like, she, she's so monotone that I think that that actually makes her sound less likable. I know, sorry, monotone people, but like there's <laughs> something about her, her tone of voice that like, I, I find that it just makes her sound dull and like maybe less interested in what you're saying, but it seems that her one-on-one -on -one relationships mm -hmm. that like she made is where she really like flourishes. So I, I feel like she doesn't pop out in group settings. Like I, I just feel like she's like, but she's very, there's something about how she connects one-on-one -on -one with people and that's where she did work in game changers. Right. Um, but I just think that it, you know, it's not an underreported story that that is how she, she got where she did in, in game changers. And the fact that people are already pulling that out, the fact that Parvati is, you know, acknowledging that she's a, a dangerous person. Um, I, I agree with Matt that I do see her as someone because I, I mentioned this earlier in the podcast that she's not one of the these people that I see is really well connected in the community. She played with Tony, but you know, yes, she played with Sandra. Um, but I don't see her coming into this season with a lot of connections. And I just don't think that she's going to be able to work her charms in the same way that she did in game changers and that she will, you know, she does ha have, it is very likely that she's seen as someone who's expendable, especially if someone's like, I want to weaken Tony, but I want him around because he is a lightning rod. And, you know, as long as Tony is around, that's attention taken mm -hmm. away from me. But, you know, he has Sarah. And as long as he has Sarah, that's someone that sneaks along and I want to get rid of that person and I could definitely see a fate like that for Sarah yeah Haley it was such a big part of her narrative where that it wasn't just that she won but it was like she was and every like everybody knows it by heart like she she was the a police officer she played like a, a, a police officer the first time but she played like a criminal the second time and, and I just think that <laughs> so when you have that baked in narrative it, it's it's really hard to shake that sure but I think a lot of these people have 
have baked in narratives that are going to follow them al- al- along through. But some game. of the narratives are like, oh, they're they're, they're so nice, or they're so ki- they're so charismatic. People, people are still saying that Parvati is going to flirt, and she's been married, she has a child, and Natalie Anderson's out here. Like, well, you know how Parvati plays the game. She's going to flirt with all the guys out here. She's going to yeah. flirt with Jeff and get some extra fire tokens. <laughs> obviously, like, come on, keep keep up a little bit, guys. <laughs> it's, um, it's, yeah. it's tough. Uh, that the some of the other things I'll say uh, in Sarah's favor though is that she is a great athlete, and if you are looking for somebody to you know pin the blame on of that you lose a challenge early on, uh, Brent, she's not going to be voted out for not being able to help the tribe in the challenges. Certainly true, and uh, I, as I said, I think that I think that she's definitely a possibility for an early boot, but not for the reasons that you might think. I just think that she could be unlikable or or as seen as expendable by people as jenny noted she doesn't have a lot of connections with the people who are currently playing the game this season so i feel like there's a real chance that they might look around and go who who's here that nobody cares about okay sarah yeah i I just want to push back a a, uh just a little bit more on the sarah is unlikable because i I just think that she just doesn't pop on television but i just feel like that the coming out of game changers that everybody there felt like that she was likable and i feel like that the people that are out there with her are gonna really feel that way uh, about her again as jenny was saying i think she's very good uh, establishing these uh one-on-one connections and there's so many parents out there she has a young kid also so i think that she's gonna have no problem getting along with people but i think that the threat level of that previous game, I think, is going to loom so large in uh, people's minds. Uh, I want to go back to with talking about with Tony and Sarah. And in my head, if they're together, that I'm thinking like, all right, well, Tony is probably going to get voted out if they're going to split up Tony and Sarah. But Matt, is it possible? Do I have this backwards? Is it possible that, hey, we got to break up Tony and Sarah and Sarah is the one that gets voted out? Yeah, definitely possible because there's so many people that want to keep Tony around, uh, you know, possibly as a mate shield. And like I, I, I'm already, you know, saying that I, I don't feel great about Sarah's chances to go far. I think people are going to want her out early. Uh, if they're looking to break that up, I definitely can see Sarah being the one that goes uh, goes first. The other thing, too, is, uh, as I said, people don't really care for game changers that much. And I really don't think like if we're talking win equity here, I really don't think that these winners that are on this island are going to want Sarah Lucina, the winner of game changers, no, to represent their season. There's like no chance of that. There's happening. there's a handful of people that I have on that kind of list of like this is the season of seasons. They're going to be crowning the champion of champions. And there's like maybe five, five, four or five names that I'm like, I don't see it. I really yeah. don't. But I think you guys are thinking about this like, uh, you know, from the perspective of, you know, fans and thinking about the history of the show. I mean, Brent, nobody knows better than you that uh, on the edge of extinction, Aubrey, David Wright, uh, and uh, others, Joe <laughs> uh, voted for the person that was on the edge of extinction. To win yeah. the game. So I, I have to, I, here's the thing though. No, I, but, uh, but in terms of the, the, the yes. Brent, we talk a lot about the integrity of the game and how yes. could these people who are the, well, like we Aubrey and David, that they, and, they just thought it was a whole different game. I feel like we're like, even though edge of extinction is in play, I feel like the people on the Island saw what happened with edge of extinction. And there's no chance of that happening again. But I, no, I, I, feel, I don't think I anybody's like. going to vote for like, well, like, uh, you know, I, yeah. I was thinking about voting for Sarah, but she, she won game changers and that's not really regarded as a season that I want to represent. Right. Like, it's I, just, I, it's, well, it's what I was saying earlier that there's there's not any clear goats in this season. So when you get yeah. to the final three, it may come down to just a, a likability factor besides the gameplay. And like, I think there I'm, is going to be someone you like more. I also think that, and I know that final three has been here since the beginning of time. It seems like with Survivor, but I feel like Sarah could win a, a final two. I I actually do feel like she could win a final two yeah. next to somebody else who was more unlikable than her. But being in a final three lets the people on the jury sort of pick from one of the above, and I don't feel like in a season like this that that really works for her yeah sarah last woman winner of the show jenny that if she pulls it off she could be the next <laughs> woman winner of the show <laughs> wow that is a weird stat that i never considered being a possibility and i i mean as much as i um you know want to defend defend Sarah as a winner in terms of whether however you feel about her personally and how, however you feel about that that season um I, I I will I will say that listen to how everyone talked about Sarah look no further than how Andrea Belke yeah talks I think that that is one of the most like Andrea seems just like 
one of the most nice, friendly, yeah. liked people in the community and the way that she felt about Sarah, I think that means something. Sari liked her. Like ev so many people. Love, yeah, like and love, also, that's, Aubrey. that's another thing though. Remember, there was a big moment on Game Changers that brought them together, like yeah, that core group of people. The yeah. Zeke, the, that tribal council, uh, Sarah w broke down huge emotional moment where she talked about, I'm a person who doesn't have Zeke's in my life and I met Zeke and mm -hmm. I love Zeke. And that, tri that one night brought them all so close together. Together. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to hope we don't have anything like that this season. So I don't know if that kind of bonding will happen, but you know, I, I that agree is a big thing. that, that point, probably Matt. really solidified some, re some relationships in that season. But I just from everything that I've heard about how people talked about uh, Sarah from that season, um, the, you know, those relationships had started bef before, like before that, I, I do agree mm -hmm. that they, they really got could have gotten strengthened by um what they went through together but like like i said already i i really think that there is something about her that doesn't like like you said uh, rob doesn't pop on screen i talk about her tone of voice um she there is something about her that is very likable to, to people but i think that again everyone knows that that was her game and and i don't think that these people are going to be fooled into thinking that shake, yeah. they are sarah's it girl yeah. um or a guy or whoever on this season and so despite it being an impressive run for her in game changers i just don't know what she does to you know, go far in this particular season Hell yeah, another big ally for Sarah is Denise Stapley. We talked about this uh, the other night when we did the uh, Denise preview, but both uh, coming from the uh, same place in Iowa. Uh, that could be, an, uh, I don't know how many people know that connection. I feel like that that could be a big one for Sarah. Cedar Rapids was also an answer on Jeopardy last night, wasn't Ooh. it? Yeah. Uh, yes, it was. <laughs> I, I think Denise and Sarah could be, be on good terms um but i'll raise you danny and sarah i think those are two people Oof. who can get along super well because why I don't think, because neither of them have a lot of connections uh out, outside of like the survivor realm like when have you ever seen danny at a, a survivor event I've, ne I've never met danny in my life so i could see her kind of looking for somebody who's similar to her from the midwest um maybe share some of the same values and family whatever i, I mm -hmm. think they could get along super well um and danny can give sarah the advice of like an old school player and sarah can kind of bring in that new school thing going on i think they could be an interesting duo if they I don't fire tokens to not see that <laughs> Where, are you really down on Danny Boat, right, Matt? Just the two of them together, like that's oh, okay. not something I need to spend time on. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I'm high on Danny Boat, right? Like uh, just because I like her, and I, I like I haven't seen her since like you know I was like 20 or something. Mm -hmm. ah, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yes, yes. What does just that even high. mean? <laughs> yeah. Some palish math. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, anybody else gunning for Sarah Lucina that we can see here on the board? I mean, do we do even the new players want to work with her that bad? Uh, I think that they do. I think that they do. Don't forget that she won season 34. So I feel like that, you know, then, um, you know, Adam is super friendly. I'm sure he was very supportive to her when, and reached out during her win. Uh, then uh, Ben comes uh, right, right ben after that. Nice. I think that uh, I'm sure that, you know, they're fr from, uh, you know, it's not not exactly the the same uh, the same place, but, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, similar part of the country uh and then you know uh wendell i'm sure was you know was uh was greeted warmly by the uh you know as a new winner and and so was nick i think by sarah so i think that she has some connections just based on the proximity of when she played to some of these with some of these other people i just think that they're all closer to each other than with her um you know the the people that are left to be discussed next week mm -hmm. i just think that you know like Adam, like Adam and Wendell are just so, you know, for newer winners, I just think are so much better connected yeah. with some of yeah. these people than but, Sarah. So I just don't think that they need Sarah. You no, know I don't I mean? think they need Sarah, but I think the threat from Sarah is coming from the past of when she played as opposed to coming from the future of when she played. Right. If that makes sense. Yep. Like, yep. I feel like that it's coming more from the people uh, we mentioned, you know, the, you know, Parvati's and, and, 
Kims and and uh, people that are more of like the when we go further back in time to people that are like I watched her season and I don't and I don't trust her that I feel like that the people that play and uh, this could be my own personal experience but I feel like the the people that played before you watch you with a different eye than the people that played after you that might have a little bit more like give you the benefit of the doubt and want to work with you as opposed to the people that played before you and it's like okay I know your game I know you're up to. Yep. Okay. All right. <laughs> no Let, argument there. No uh, argument there. Real quick, Jenny, can we get a star sign on okay. Sarah? So I so I have to report that I had like a, a major um I get to question everything I knew today because I have spent the last couple of years thinking that Sarah was a fellow Libra, like you know. Rob, Haley, mm -hmm. myself. Yeah. Um, and I, because I, I keep a spreadsheet and I only get my data from like Wikia or whatever. Um, and sometimes things change. And at some point, Sarah's birthday, birthday changed, changed on the internet, at least. And yeah. so I had had her recorded as a Libra in my spreadsheet for some time. I don't know when that changed. Apparently, she is a cancer, um, which makes a lot of sense. Cancers are very like, um, who said that, Brent? <laughs> oh Jesus, bro! No. What? <laughs> that was that was a funny joke. That was a funny joke. Um, <laughs> but cancers are are very um like se sensual, emotional people, yeah. and so it makes sense to me that Sarah thrives in the one on one connections. Um, I can definitely see that from a cancer. You know, the emotional way that she used. Um, you know, like the the bracelet and the ring and like mm -hmm. these these physical pieces with her relationships um the way that she used that uh th that emotion the connection to home cancers are very like homebody type people makes a lot of sense why she's not very big in the community anyway so i thought she was a libra until today she is a cancer or maybe it's all wrong or okay. maybe you all think it's so, bullshit. So, all right so, all right so uh <laughs> does that does that figure uh, prominently, like a, in a good way for her, or, so or the the most winning element of um survivors is Earth. So the most winning oh. sign is Capricorn. Capricorns um represent the hot have the highest representation of winners. Um, and then Earth signs in general, which is uh Capricorn, Taurus, and Virgo, have the the biggest representation. So water doesn't Cancer is a water sign. They're not super high up um in in the winners. Uh, so I don't I don't know what what that means for her. It means that she's good at making emotional connections, whether mm. that is going to be the key to success in this particular season. I'm okay. not sure. I've heard All that. All right. Before. Uh actually let's do our Sarah prediction. Are you hey, you're a hey. cancer? Oh no, you're Leo, aren't no, you? No, no, no. I just meant about yeah. Sarah. Sorry, yes. Okay. <laughs> Haley, you have a Sarah prediction. Uh I think she's gonna at least make the merge, if not further. Okay. Sarah at, at the merge and watch out for her. I think she's somebody who could win those challenges that are the, you know, hey, stand in, uh, stand in one place. Did she win a lot of challenges in, in Game Changers? I'm trying to remember. She's uh, never won an individual immunity. I oh, believe. interesting. Interesting. Yeah, she, As a member of the Braun she was, tribe. She was winning. She she won a lot of tribal immunities. She was didn't go to a lot of early uh, um, tribals in mm -hmm. Game Changers, but... Okay, Jenny, uh, what's your prediction on Sarah? I think she's pre-merge. Pre-merge. Uh, it's tough to shake that target when it's on your back, Matt. Pre-merge. Pre-merge. And Brent, what do you think? Three for three. Pre-merge. Three for three on the pre-merge. Three for uh, four. What am I? <laughs> Why well, you you were not with us, so you don't. I know. Three three three. Three. Yeah. Yeah. I think oh, it's sorry. What am I just I like was, uh, just a, <laughs> I, there was some symmetry because it went like pre-merge, pre-merge, pre-merge. So yeah. Fine, I'll just leave. <laughs> and and the people in the chat that are bitching about astrology, if Rob's gonna ask me what people signs yeah, we're not are, we're gonna do a whole show to... about it. But I feel uh, like yeah. if Jenny's prepared to talk. Uh, to <laughs> talk I, if about I have it. something, I can it's... tell you what color their hair is too. Like exactly. yeah, whatever, it's, it's <laughs> fun and kitschy, and is Fine. interesting to like just segue to for a second. Like yeah. calm down, people. So calm down. Take it easy, everybody. It's all okay. it's all gonna be okay. 
Okay. Uh, I, I'll say I feel like that the arrow is pointing down on Sarah, not because she's not good, but just because I think that people are going to be way too focused. I, I really feel like I was listening to Sarah's interview today, and I just felt like that she's uh, like going in hoping that people are going to forget about their previous game. And I just, uh, you know, f I, I, I can't help but feel like, yeah, uh, I kind of felt that way too back in Survivor All Stars. Uh, right. Like people yeah. don't forget. Uh, they, re they remember this stuff. And it's she just especially. Didn't see so sorry. She if they, if they don't feel like they can trust you, uh, it's tough. It's tough to win that back. They might like you, but they might not trust you. Yeah, she's she's like guns a blazing into the season for some reason. I, I don't know why she feels like she's got this like loud energy about her. I, I don't know why she is coming in with this, but it's, I don't think it's going to oh, Let's hope for her sake that it, that was just like indicative of that interview specifically and not how she's going to play the overall game because mm -hmm. like, she has to know that's not a winning formula. Maybe it's like some sort of Freaky Friday thing with like her, <laughs> her and, Tony? and Tony and Tony's like really relaxed <laughs> right? and that's like what's happening. he's like it. sucked up all of his like you know, neurotic energy or something. I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's talk about Natalie next yeah. and then we'll go to Jeremy because then we can talk about season 29 and then, and then Jeremy also then has the, the uh, season 31 stuff to add on to that. But uh, let's talk about Natalie. Uh, Haley, were you a, a 20 fan from the amazing race? I wasn't. And I, when spoiler alert, when they went out first in all stars, I was like, yay, I don't have to deal with. I believe that was also in 2014. I believe that that was in the, in the spring of the year that she ended up winning survivor. I think that was all in the same year. Yeah. But like, and I don't think I'm alone in that. I think a lot of people were anti 20 about around then. And then all of a sudden she comes in and plays survivor. And I don't think anyone thought either of the twins were going to do well in survivor. And mm -hmm. then, so when, Nadia went out so early. I think we're all like, well, Natalie's pretty close behind. So when she pulled out a lot of really excellent and cool and fun moves in the later half of the season, and when she won, it was such a satisfying win. It, like we haven't seen what feels like a very satisfying win in, in a while. And I think, like you said, 2014 was really, you know, a great time to be a Survivor fan. It was a great year. Uh, yeah, the Natalie Anderson run in Survivor of uh, San Juan del Sur uh, was really so interesting. You know, she starts off uh, with the, she loses her twin sister in the very first episode, uh, but then her and Jeremy are, you know, uh, and Jeremy loses Val early on and they're uh, tight allies and they end up, they're separated at the swap, but then they end up coming back together at the merge and there's a whole, you know, it looks like Jeremy is going to go out, but then it's actually Josh that goes out and he's, and everything is looking good. And then Jeremy gets blindsided and Natalie ends up going on. I have to get revenge, but I have to let these people think I'm working with them. And it is a slow and methodical revenge that she takes on John Mish and Jacqueline and uh, all Alec Christie, all the co-conspirators along the way to ultimately win. And now she's back, Matt. I am so excited for this. Natalie is the reason I'm on this podcast. She's the one name, one of the names that I wrote down that I, I was most excited to, to talk about, to see here. I, uh, everything Haley just said about how, you know, that was such a feel good win. Uh, I, I loved that season at the time. I still love it so much to this day, just watching it as it played out. And you had those two big players with Josh and Jeremy, and one of those guys are going to win. And then they both go out and you're like, Oh wait, wait they're not going to win. So who is going to win? Uh, is it John? Is it Missy? And then it starts to become a little bit more clear over time that Natalie is somebody playing a good game and going into the season as somebody who watched the amazing race. Like you're, not expecting that the 20s are going to do well you're not expecting much from them you're just you know they were fun characters on the amazing race they brought them over to survivor makes sense but then as the game starts to you know get towards the end and you see all these uh great moves that she's making and how she's thinking like she's playing like a like a strong player and it just it, it's impressive and it's fun and just by the time the finale comes around and you see the entire jury just applauding her and giving her all this respect and every time that she explains a move that she just made or that's something that happened they're all smiling because they're like damn how did we let that one happen like how did we let that get by us uh it's just so much fun all around and as somebody who just loves natalie so much i'm so excited that she's back um i don't I, like i don't even uh, part of me doesn't even want to imagine how she's going to do this season because it's just the, my memories of her are so good and i'm just afraid that they might not you know i, I don't want anything bad to happen to her 
Yeah, but it's like sport, though, Matt. Like, you know, Janet Lynn said in figure skating that everything is sport and nothing can be taken away from you. Like, we will always have that. Yes. Like, even if she falls on her face in this season, we will always have that. What the 2017 memories. Astros said. I, I oh, God. <laughs> uh, the, the, the thing that I really appreciate about Natalie is the fact that she is an emotional person like I am and wears her heart on her sleeve, but she was able to keep her emotions in check when she got done so dirty by John and Jacqueline. You, people forget, maybe you guys don't forget, but fans forget that Jeremy and Natalie gave up their reward on a yacht to John and Jacqueline to thank them for their votes at the previous tribal council. And then John and Jacqueline decided to uh, pay back uh, Natalie and Jeremy by blindsiding Jeremy at that famous tribal council where he went out and couldn't believe it. And then, like Rob says, it's literally like uh, it's like a, a, a Dexter, where like like the the antihero, although in this case Natalie's definitely a hero, uh, was like working behind the scenes to like uh, kill all the people who betrayed her and yeah. had done her wrong. Great and it story. was so great to watch. So yeah. like I honestly. Of all, I mean, I know that there have been a bunch of alpha guys who've had some interesting end game runs on Survivor, but for my money, like I'm with Matt on this one. Nobody touches the like final nine stretch that Natalie had from losing her ally in Jeremy, obviously losing her own sister in the beginning of the game, and like calling out Rocker. Like she played from the front; she didn't play in the back. She played from the front and still got it done. So I was so here for her win, and uh, I really it annoys me that that was a blood versus water season because she should have won unanimously. Like even John Mish is like you know nodding his head when Natalie is explaining her moves, but obviously he can't vote for her because, you know, Jacqueline is up there or something. And yeah, he has but to vote Reed for didn't vote for her. Yeah, Reed no, voted even... you petty against Missy. <laughs> Who? I don't even know. Sorry, Jacqueline, yeah, that was so bizarre. Yeah. yeah whatever. Uh, one of my favorite, favorite moments was, you know, uh, Natalie had the idol and Jacqueline had been kind of screwed over by Missy and Baylor. And, you know, she, she had come up with this plan and Missy and Baylor thought Natalie was on their side and she gets up and, uh, you know, takes her idol to Jeff. And then she turns around to Jacqueline and says, did you vote for who I, who I told you to vote for? And Jacqueline says, yes. And I think, and then she plays the idol for Jacqueline. And then I, one of Baylor, did Baylor go? I Baylor, don't remember. Yeah, Baylor yeah, went. Baylor yeah. went. An and incredible tribal council. It was, an, it was a great move because not only did it get her to where she wanted to go but the jury saw her making that move which i think was incredibly important to her game you know the jury doesn't see a lot of these moves because they're back on the beach but this was a move that was like hey yeah. i told you to vote for her so did you do it yes i convinced you to do that well then i'm going to save you it's like a two for one move it yeah, really it, is. And it wasn't, people think like, oh, she had an idol. She played on Jacqueline, but she knew everyone was voting for Keith. Like that wasn't without risk. Like there was a way for Jacqueline to technically betray her by also voting for Natalie and then causing a tie. Maybe they would have sent Natalie home because she didn't play the idol for herself. Like there were ways for that to go wrong. And she still had the cojones to go for it and give her, put herself in position to get the win. And I just absolutely loved it. I mean, you'd, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody in the RHAP community who didn't love that tribal council and everything that it begat. So like, I'm feeling great about Natalie, but I'm also worried that uh, some of her more interesting and, and uh, television worthy moves might be remembered well by people on this cast. So oh, I'm Steve, nervous about that. I, I don't know that this is such a weird season in terms of talking about it, where I, I feel like it is not a celebrated season at, at all. Like, you know, I think that Jeremy ends up getting a ton of credit for second chances when he comes back and he wins but I feel like that for whatever reason and I always theorized that it was because Natalie was somebody who came from the amazing race and that that they weren't like proud of her as a winner because she was somebody that was from one of the other uh, CBS shows that that came on although they really loved Beast Mode Cowboy when he came to her. <laughs> uh, that, so bizarre uh, but they never that, that even at the reunion they couldn't wait to start talking about hey we got to talk about what's coming up. Survivor worlds apart. Like, uh, do we have any lawyers in the audience? Like they were, re they, they, they went right into hyping the next Which, season. Matt, uh, Rob, it's just boggling to me that I, I don't understand. Natalie was one of their best winners ever. It, they didn't was, appreciate her. And then she was funny too. Like, remember when she was like holding the thing up and she like tried to spit, but then the spit went all <laughs> yeah, over that's herself. That's a great <laughs> challenge. And, 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 and oh. yeah, that's where Wes Nail is asking Jeff Probst about the bacon. 
in and say, is that's a you know a whole a, a really great challenge. Uh, oh, but so God. so she's not really a celebrated winner. I, I think that she came close to coming back for Game Changers, as uh, Jenny had brought up earlier in the show. I'm not sure how many people really know a ton about Natalie Anderson. Matt, do you feel like that people are looking at her as like, oh, we got to watch out for her? I think that maybe as, as a challenge beast, I think they're saying like, oh, we got to watch out for her. She'll win all the challenges. But uh, I don't think that people really look at her as, oh, if she is an elite survivor winner. I think for the majority of them, I agree. I, I don't think that most people will look at her that way and that should do well for her. But I do think there are some people who I, I just, I specifically because I just listened to Sophie's interview. Sophie's somebody who calls out, uh, you know, I was just kind of like rewatching some seasons before we left and like Natalie Anderson, that's a smart cookie out there. Like she knows what she's doing. You don't think back at uh, that season and think like, oh, Natalie was like, she was on top of all of those moves that she made towards the end of the game. So, you know, if uh, I'm sure Sophie's not the only one but she is the only one who at least mentioned it in that interview um mm -hmm. I, I have to hope that people aren't thinking like that because they are surrounded by such like even bigger sharks than the natalie it's you know there's a lot of players who are remembered for their great gameplay of yeah. course in, in the season i don't know if natalie is going to be the top of the list but she's definitely up there i feel like that that's not a a a, a great relationship i feel like that uh so sophie. sophie natalie anderson i don't i don't see them getting along I'm sure oh, they've both really? been to the same know-it-alls, right? right? No, Natalie came to like two of them. and Sophie I just feel like I, I used to ask there. Natalie Anderson, so are you going to be in the wine and cheese now that you're, you're, you're this? You, and I remember her saying like, oh no, they don't invite, they don't invite uh, me to this stuff. Uh, I just feel like that, hmm. th that she's at home with more of like the blue collar beer drinking uh you oh know, yeah uh, fellow and players that we're talking I, about on this panel i totally agree with that i feel like the people that she's more likely to work with would be like you know ben drebergen and nick wilson and wendell like these are the people that i feel like that natalie could work with not that wendell's necessarily blue, blue collar but i feel like that he could he makes furniture crap. brent yeah well that too yeah I, he's always so suave to me that i always like feel like he's a little bit more metro anyway the point being that i feel like she has a lot of options to choose about who she wants to work with uh the thing that uh i i think a lot of people don't really understand about natalie is that it as rob notes it was really methodical like this is what i'm currently having a problem on in sequesters that people aren't thinking ahead and natalie was the queen of thinking ahead in terms of like realizing that she needed to get rid of alec and fake it so that that john didn't have power over her to move forward into the final six and then she needed to get rid of john john at the final six and how to do that she went on that as i reminded in the chat the spaghetti reward with john and jacqueline where she like smooths them the whole day right before she was going to blindside them and then on to keeping Jacqueline in the game at the final five to make sure that she wouldn't be voted off by Missy and Baylor at the final four like everything had a plan with Natalie it was like such a great season and so it's honestly mystifying to me that CBS considering they don't have tons of women and also don't have tons of women of color as winners for them not mm -hmm. to celebrate her more but let's hope she fixes that this time by winning this season okay yeah and it's, it's not looking like uh you know all i i don't know how again how great i feel about her chances and that's what i'm afraid to talk about here just because another thing that she brings up is uh she she's talking about how you know poverty flirts with all the guys and that's how she plays the game uh and and she's saying, well, I, I, I'm just like, the, I'm one of the guys. I'm just, you know, I bro down with all the guys and, and whatnot. So I don't know. Is she like going into it with this mindset Which of, I, I'm, not I'm only too dissimilar from how, what got Nadia in trouble, uh, the tribal council that she got voted out. Yeah. So, I mean, is, is if, she, if she's going in with that kind of strategy and like not paying enough attention to the women in her tribe right away, then that's not going to be good. But she also said, I'm all about girl power. I'm happy to work with them too. So uh, I don't know. I feel like it could go. I, oh, sorry. It sounded like Kelly. Uh, I could go either way here, but um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Brent, uh, don't forget, Brent is here. You're going to be a fancy fence. No, but it's Matt, uh, just like have she, the have the have the balls to go for it. Say, so, you know what? She's going to the final three. That's what's happening with no, Natalie, because that's like, my 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 prediction is the other way. Oh, yeah. really? And that's where I'm leaning. Uh, uh, you think I, she's out early? I, I don't. I don't know. I, no way. I feel like that her and Boston Rob are like perfect. I feel like like Natalie would work great with Boston Rob if she's on the same tribe as him. I feel like that they would like go together like peas and carrots. So I just I, try. I, I, I keep trying to tell myself early. that she has the ability to make people fall in love with her, as all of us mm -hmm. did as fans watching the game and as Without Miss trying. Survivor. <laughs> of course, yes. So I mean, if she can work that charm on anybody out there, just keep them laughing. She's funny. Keep them laughing. She's uh, so natural. 
she, it's she, so she everybody natural. is hysterically laughing anytime they're around her. So she, if she can keep that kind of energy, I think she'll be fine. She so. hasn't been on the podcast in a long time, but whenever I talk to her, I, I can't stop laughing. She's uh, that, uh, you know, you could just uh, like, uh, N- Natalie, what do you think about this? Natalie, what do you think about this? And she has me rolling whenever uh, we get to talk. Haley, how do you think that uh, we've talked to, uh, more about her game in season 29? How, how do you think that she's going to come back and play here in season 40? Someone in the comments I, I saw said that uh, she won't be afraid of making big moves because she's already gone out early in one of these shows. And it's true. Like, I feel like she's not going to be afraid to I was go say, out. That was her sister. No, but like in, in the Amazing, <laughs> no, Amazing Race, she went out early. Amazing Race, yes. But, you know, and people forget that she also has like three seasons of reality television behind her. I think Four, that's right. Oh, sorry. You may be right. <laughs> I can't. King had amazing races. Technically, right now, two she amazing does. races. <laughs> two, uh, one survivor. This will be four for her. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think that's a really big advantage for her. Like, like you guys said, I think once you get on the island, people are going to love her. They're going to love having her around. She's a good she, worker. She's a hoot. She's a good worker. She's a great athlete. So you're not going to vote her out in the first, you know, a couple of weeks because you want that kind of strength. On and your she's team. not overly sneaky. Like, I mean, if anybody is scared of Natalie Anderson, I feel like they're at least going to recognize the fact that if, in many ways her hands were tied mm-hmm. and what she had to do in Blood versus Water. I mean, she couldn't take John and Jacqueline any further in the game. She couldn't. She had to betray uh, Missy and Baylor at the final five because she didn't want to go into the final four with a couple. I mean, like, I'm sure she didn't want to betray them, but she had to from a numbers point of view. So I feel like if she can sell it that way, she'll be fine. Yeah, and I just think there's a lot bigger targets here than, than her. I really, it's hard for me to see a scenario where they go, Natalie's the one we got to get out right, right now. I don't see it either. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it, I'm, I think she's going to at least make it past the merge. I'm really hoping t- she does because she's going to be a really fun player to watch in this situation. And it's I, I want to see her play with Sandra. I, I don't know if that's because I, I don't know. I the think title, that they, they, they be sure. allied. Yeah, yeah, I think that sure. they have a lot in common. They're, bo- they're both people who are outspoken and straight shooters. And I think that they would uh, and bo- and both of them are not bougie that they're both gonna they're gonna get along well and they're going to right. uh, i think have a lot in common and be able to be very <laughs> relatable to one another who's oh one person on this cast that is not gonna like natalie i am look i'm scrolling through it and i can't see one person who's like if natalie you know is what going maybe into not it. except maybe so except maybe sophie but if natalie's going into it saying she's worried about poverty and she doesn't like the way poverty plays the game that's what worries me because i don't want poverty on my bad side on any survivor season yeah. so that's yeah, but natalie weird. doesn't care did poverty say that did poverty say that about natalie no just, no, not. she said that she doesn't like the way poverty plays the game, and if that gets oh, out, but yeah, she was yeah, yeah. talking about poverty as saying that she really respects her. Like I didn't love how Natalie talked about poverty and like the flirt game, and, like, and she does that that trope that I absolutely and I love Natalie. Natalie was my winner pick. I don't like mm-hmm. changing my winner picks. I didn't love some of the stuff I saw in the interview today, but she did that thing where it's like like Matt already mentioned, like, oh, I'm kind of like a guy's girl, like, you know, playing down, like, oh, I'm not like, I'm not like the other girls. Like she didn't actually say that, but it was that, that similar kind of thing that I, that I didn't love yeah. that for her. However, she's just so naturally charismatic without trying. There's something about when she talks, the way, the way that she is, she's just unapologetically Natalie Anderson and in such a likable way that it's like you can't even be mad and the way that she was able to get through um, her season betraying people but having an excuse I've never seen John Wick but I feel like uh, that's John what I Mish. think it was John Mish, John <laughs> Mish. <laughs> I was like John Wick who's that, <laughs> I, like, that a movie? Is, yeah. <laughs> doesn't John Wick like his dog dies or something and then he like kills a bunch of people like that's like what I think Whatever. about I don't know. <laughs> sorry okay well it's an old movie and I haven't seen it so it's I'm real. sorry for nothing but um, <laughs> but like I I just think that she was able to like you know betray people in a yeah. way where it was like you you're absolutely justified for doing this and like she was dr- she was driven by losing Nadia she was driven by losing Jeremy and i think that that's something that people will remember is that like she when she has someone she picks as her person her 20 or her honorary 20 that she she is a ride or die for that for that person so on the you know on the flip side with someone like sarah who we've already discussed where she was abs she was you know would betray absolutely anyone Mm -hmm. 
what Natalie did was we didn't, we never saw any, any sign of her turning on Jeremy. So it was when, you know, and Jeremy was her yeah. person. And when Jeremy got blindsided, that's when she was like, all right, like time to get dirty. And so I think that that could really help, um, Natalie in that she doesn't have this schemey air to right. her that some of these other players really do. Yeah, it's so interesting to talk about her in comparison to Sarah that we just got into talking about where it's like, oh, Sarah is a backstabber, but Natalie is loyal. Well, you know, they, they both like had to stab a bunch of people in the back to get to the end. But because it's sort of like the the, the narrative is this was vengeance. This was that Natalie exactly. is fiercely loyal. Uh, and Sarah just had to just backstab everybody who she was working with when it's probably a lot closer when you look at it. But it's but just that like, perception you know. is so important. Mm -hmm. And I, I really think that people will remember that. And like everyone has already said, there's just so many other big names that I just you know, even, even me where I loved Natalie, I loved that season. And I was so happy when she won rewatching some of the, you know, some of the highlights of that season. Like I almost forgot how impressive it was. And I just think that, that some of that amnesia about that, that time and survivor can actually, you know, not, not every person going out there rewatched yeah. all of these seasons going into Five it. Five years I, since she played. Yeah. yeah. I, I really think um, th that she, I, I'm very being very hopeful. Like I said, she was my winner pick, and I'm not going to change it. Um, okay, but I, I'm I'm really really rooting for her. And if she could tone down the the poverty stuff and maybe just not say that to anyone else, that would be ideal. So, <laughs> all right, here's Natalie. We are going to talk about Jeremy in a couple of minutes, but that she has this key ally from her first season. Matt, this is huge. Uh, are they going to be seen as a potential pair that also needs to get broken up? And if so, like Tony and Sarah, it, 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 could it be Natalie that is the person who ends up getting knocked out to break up Jeremy and Natalie? Uh, maybe um, to, there, there's so many pairs in this season that it, it's hard to say like which one is going to be the most threatening out of all of them. You, I mean, Robin, Amber, Sandra, this, that, whatever. So I, I don't think that Jeremy, what Haley? I, just, I was, no, I was, I was going to say like Jeremy and uh, Natalie are the ones who you're wor worried about when there's literally a okay. married couple here. <laughs> I thought you were going to yell at me for. No, 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 no. <laughs> I totally agree with you. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that they're going to stand out as the biggest threat uh, or the biggest pair. There will definitely be a point where they do need to get broken up. But I also feel like, I mean, we'll, we'll get into more of the Jeremy stuff soon, but uh, Jeremy is somebody that I'm very high on this season. And I think a lot of people are also going to recognize that Jeremy is potentially more of a threat, I think, in the long run than Natalie is. So while Natalie may be the more volatile, like big mouth and all that kind of stuff, Jeremy is somebody that you need to look out for. Okay. Who else uh, could Natalie be working with? Uh, Brent, do you see any any other natural allies for Natalie here? I mean, Danny Bowright, I feel like, would be a natural ally for Natalie because she needs allies herself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, as I said before, They're both sporty. I, yeah, I feel like Natalie has so many options, maybe too many mm -hmm. options. I, I mean, maybe you can't ever yeah. have too many options in Survivor, but uh, she's bound to make someone upset if she has everybody coming to her. I Again, she's five years ago, real time. Like, not many people remember what she did. It was great, but even then, I feel like so many of her moves were forced. Like, she her hand was forced in what she had to do, even if she did do them brilliantly. So I, I, I got to feel like she's got a really above even shot here. Jane, she has another uh, fellow Jersey girl uh, in uh, Michelle. Yeah, I, that was someone I thought of. I think that they're very different, but I, but I also the more I, the more I think about it, I can see them really getting along. I think that I mean, you guys will talk about Michelle, but I think that Michelle co comes in with a lot of options, and I think that there are going to be people clamoring to pick up Michelle. Yeah. Um, Natalie, I definitely think is someone that would really benefit from having an ally like Michelle, and they do ha have that you know New Jersey connection. The other thing that um I wanted to note, I don't know this. This is obviously a couple of years ago, but. In the Game Changers podcast that she did with you, Rob, Natalie was rooting for Sarah. 
She said oh, she does CrossFit as well. So oh. she was like, she said, if I had been, if if I had played, I would have worked with with Sandra and Tony. I would, you know, kept us together and taken out all these little people. Now that Sandra and Tony are gone, so this was the point. I think she, the podcast was like after uh, Haley and Ozzy went. She was rooting for Sarah, and she mentions it various times throughout the podcast. Um, her only real reasoning was that she does CrossFit and she's like an athletic girl and she's strong and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, I have no idea if they've if they've ever met or connected since then, but I do think that that is something to note that she was rooting for Sarah and Game Changers. Okay. All right. You want to do predictions for Natalie Anderson? Sure. Matt, where's Natalie Anderson ending up? I'll go with the optimistic side of me and say somewhere in the middle of the merge, like not, not at the merge a little bit after the merge. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Brent, how about you? I think she goes far. I, I really do. Uh, Did you win? You see her at the end. Yeah, She can win. There are people who I have on my list who cannot win. She is not one of those people. She can absolutely win. If she's sitting in the final three, it depends on who she's up against and what she's done to get there. Okay. Jenny. I mean, I made her my winner pick before like weeks ago or possibly months ago. And I, I, I'm not going to turn back on that. So, uh, I think that I'm, I'm going to be optimistic, like Matt just said, and I am going to picture her going far. And I agree with Brent that she's absolutely someone who, if she can get to the end that she wins. So okay. I'm going to stay optimistic. <laughs> All right. And Haley, how about you? I think she's going to make a deep run. And I feel like even if she does get voted out, she's going to, she would kill it on Extinction Island. Extinction, Edge of Extinction. <laughs> edge of Extinction. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> edge of Extinction. Care. I think she'd be really good on there. I think people yeah. would like her and I think she'd be good at the competition. I feel like she'd search for whatever she had to search for. So even if she gets voted out, I don't think it's over for her. She's yeah. scrappy. Yeah. Like, yeah. Scrappy. The panel loves Natalie Anderson. Big Natalie. Girl. We do. Yeah. yeah. I, mm. I'm trying to imagine the scenario for her where it goes poorly. The only thing I could think about is if, uh, you know, it's her and Jeremy and people feel like enough people feel like, uh, oh, if if Natalie wasn't around, Jeremy would be my yeah. person. Uh, that's the only way I really feel like that this goes uh, south for her. I yeah. also I think that she can't hold back in the challenges like I could see her coming out and, and being somebody who wins uh, a couple of immunities after the merge. And then people say, oh, we have to vote out Natalie. Yeah. No, she, and then yeah, she, she gets back she in on through extension extinction. Yep. She's got a lot of outs here. We are right. Standersons here on on the round table. Uh she's so much fun. Okay. All right. What, what if like the more recent uh female winners, as in the two of them, uh <laughs> are worried that or <laughs> maybe they're maybe Who? they're upset that they never got a chance to win this survivor and uh Ooh. they take that out on her. <laughs> I think they're going to take it out on Natalie Anderson. Yeah. As the reigning Miss Survivor. Like what if uh, Michelle and Sarah are both like, we like, never we didn't even out. get an opportunity. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Michelle could have made her own. And then we that. can also blame it on you, Rob, in case that happens. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> blame it on, blame it on me. Why did you stop doing it again? I uh, forgot. I forgot uh, about Miss Survivor. A, a litany of reasons. Got a reasons. Reason. <laughs> many of them came up in Survivor uh, Cambodia. Oh. Uh, I wonder how many of your listeners were around during the Miss and Mr. Survivor days. Yeah, I, I think I was part of RHAP for like two and a half years before I really realized I'm like, oh, that's a thing. Like, like that <laughs> happens. Like, oh, okay, that's a and they, and then I was like, oh wow, it's a really big deal. And then it yeah, went away. come on, Tweeny, let's go. <laughs> God, I was not prepared. For that. Sorry about that. Okay, all right. <laughs> let's wait, Rob. Don't you yeah. want to know what Nat Natalie? Oh yes, is? yes, yes. Okay, so she's what, an so, Aries. I, she's and, an Aries. Oh wow, who, she is such is an Aries. Right? Sorry. Who's who's the older sister, Natalie or Nadia? I think Nadia is. Okay. I'm not. I'm. Actually, I am just guessing. guessing. I I will get back to you. I, but I feel I like Natalie. I've heard. I feel I feel like I've heard that it was an audio. But I, if I'm wrong, then I had a fifty percent chance. Um, she's a, she's an Aries, very fiery, blunt, um, passionate Whoa. kind of person. Uh, like like Haley just said, she's textbook Aries. So, okay, I love Natalie. I'm so excited to see her play again. All right, now the man who stumped for Natalie said, uh, "Come on, give it to Natalie." Uh, Jeremy Collins is here. 
uh he's not here he's not here, here. Uh, <laughs> he's, he is going to be on this season jeremy who uh was the person who uh came in cave is the firefighter who came in hot into survivor san juan del sur wanted to surround and drown wanted to make a big alliance with everybody that was in his tribe uh, he ran into the Christie brothers. They tested his patience. He survived a uh, mano a mano showdown with Josh only to be blindsided and sent to the jury. And ultimately, Natalie was able to get her vengeance for Jeremy. He comes back into Survivor Second Chances and then is everybody's best friend. Everybody loves Jeremy. He even ends up playing an idol on Stephen Fishback for some reason. He ends up working with Spencer and Tasha and gets to the end. Val tells him they're having a baby boy. Baby boy. <laughs> uh, he has another baby boy since then. And now Jeremy wins 10 nothing in Survivor Cambodia. And now here he is back nine seasons later. Okay. And he's going to do it again. Oh, my God. I love it. All right. <laughs> my winner pick. Okay. All right. All right. Well, Matt, tell us why, why are you feeling so good about Jeremy? The same reasons I felt good about him in second chances. I, I picked him in that season. Uh, probably the only winner pick that I've ever gotten, uh, unless I'm forgetting. But uh, he's just the perfect kind of player to go into a season like this. You you know, you know, he's 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 a good player, but he doesn't stand out as one of the biggest threats for some reason. I don't understand why it's like that. But you know, he he says his game is I play for my family. I'm just here for them. And you know, he's he's calm. He's mellow. He's somebody good to work with. And just everything about his game tells you that he's going to last long and when he can get good allies underneath him like he did in cambodia takes him all the way to the end yeah and he's got twice as big of a family as he had when he played in survivor cambodia mm -hmm. yeah uh yeah. so i'm gonna throw a little bit of water on that i i, I feel oh. I, you know, I look i feel like jeremy would be an outstanding winner of this season and he may yet win but i have to believe that the people who are playing on this season are smart enough to realize that if Jeremy is anywhere near the final three, he is such a salt of the earth kind of guy. There is no way they're beating him. I disagree with Matt in that. I think that they will realize that Jeremy is there and is a massive threat to win the game. Like he was able to slide by in uh, se uh, second chances because people didn't realize that like they didn't, it just didn't dawn on them that Jeremy sitting in the final three obviously he's going to win. He's just like somebody you like and you just want to give the money to. He's such a great social presence. That is not going to happen this time. He is going to have to fight tooth and nail. I, look, I think he survives for a while. I think that they're, he's not sneaky, so I feel like other people around him will go out. But I do feel like once it gets down to like final eight, final seven, then he's going to have to work. But in Modern Day Survivor, as noted on the previous podcast, I can't remember where I heard. Maybe it's, maybe it's the preseason podcast. I can't remember. But like uh, with all the advantages and idols and, you know, fire making that's in the game, he might, that's, that might be all he needs to get to the end is uh, just get, get him to the final eight, final seven, and, and he's got a chance. So I have to believe if they have a chance to get rid of him, they're gonna. He did have two idols in uh, season 31. Uh, could not find the idol, and he went to go look for it in uh, season 29. But he's gotten he's gotten better at that. Uh, Haley, well, what's your reaction to Jeremy Collins here? I am really excited to see him back. I think he's a fun player. I think he's a smart player. He gives great confessionals. Um, I am excited to see him and Natalie team up again to see what happens there. Yeah. Um. I think he could go far. I do worry just a bit for him, but what's the concern? I I'm not even sure. It's just that he is so smart and he's so great. And he's, I, I, I think he's pretty, he's very charming and people like him. Um, but like Natalie, I think, I think there are bigger targets around than him. So I'm hoping I think that that's wishful thinking. I, I I really feel like of the people who are on the show, yeah. he has to be top three in terms You're of right. somebody You're right. you do not want to be sitting with in the final three. No, I agree with that. And that's kind of my my well, apprehension with Jeremy. But I just like him yeah. so much. I, I think there's a, a couple of different ways to look at it where I feel like that he is a threat in terms of like, well, I, I'm not going to the end with Jeremy, uh, but he's not Boston Rob. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's not somebody that it's like, all right, hey, everybody. All right. This is an easy one. Uh, go after Jeremy at, at this at this vote. So 
I, I think that he is uh, not somebody you would want to go to the end with, but I don't think that he is somebody that anybody is going to feel like is especially threatening. He's and he's set up well. I think he's got the the new people on his side if they need him, uh, and he's obviously got connections to the older players in the whole Boston Rob and poker thing. Uh, it sounds like he and Tyson might be some kind of thing that that'll happen out there. So if he's got these connections to bring him far into the game, and you know what, even if they vote him out, Jeremy is the exact kind of person that could come back from the edge of extinction and uh, you know find an idol and find his way in the, all the way to the end. So I think the twist of the season works in his favor. He'll be able to figure out the stupid fire tokens, and uh, he's got friends. I just he's I, a fire man. Point. There you <laughs> yeah. go. I see it. I see it looking up. Yeah. Okay. Jenny, well, what's your take on Jeremy Collins? I love him so much. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I'm like already getting emotional just thinking about it because because uh, I am an emotional person, apparently. Mm -hmm. And um, rewatching some some parts of Cambodia, uh, like hearing the way he talks about Val, hearing the way he talks about his family. Yeah. He's an incredible human and I have he's one he's one of the winners that I've just never been so happy for them just like not just not just happy about the game like their their win from the game perspective or an entertainment perspective or like satisfying like genuinely happy for him as a person and I've never met him in my entire life and I think that that is something to note because Jeremy is one of those people that I put in a separate category of, and I, I kind of alluded to this earlier that put them in any situation in playing survivor and just their natural personality will take them far. Tyson's another person that I, that I list in that they're just the natural charisma without trying. Jeremy is so likable, so likable. And I think that there's just something so genuine about him and he doesn't come off schemey. Um, and even, even though he, you know, won that season by everyone feeling like he was, you know, their best friend, um, you know, kind of a, not, not exactly like it, but a little bit similar to how Sarah did it. Um, for some reason, it just doesn't have that same feeling of being like, oh, well, like, careful. If you think that you're really, like, in with Jeremy, Jeremy, he probably has, like, a bunch of other people that he's also really in with. And he's insulating himself with you. Yeah. There's just something about well, the way that he is. Like, it just doesn't does not come off as like skeezy and like yeah. he's just so incredible i was oh much backstabbing so i yeah. think that helped out with and it. he got he's lucky on a couple of the people that were his friends got taken out in things that had nothing to do with him mm -hmm. like andrew exactly. savage got idled out of the game who was uh, a, a close friend of his and then somebody who really pushed for him on the jury and then steven ends up getting voted out in a plan that jeremy wasn't really a part of so or or, or wasn't a part of after this uh you know jeremy went out on a limb to save steven so he was fortunate in that he didn't have to do a lot of backstabbing and he had all these great relationships uh across the board where it wasn't as uh, difficult to untangle as it potentially could have been and people remember idol plays and i really think that it's so helpful that jeremy played that idol on steven whether you know mm -hmm. like what that meant for steven's longevity in the game um and and whether that ended up being really key to jeremy's win in the long run that's arguable but i think that just the reputation of being the kind of guy that mm -hmm. would play an idol on you is so important because there's just so many other players in this season that you know are always going to be so self-interested and um even though jeremy is self-interested because he's playing for his family and that's always going to be his thing that's never going to change there's a way that he plays and the way that he he connects with people and the the very fact that we've seen him use idols to protect an ally that I'd rather be working with the person that might play their idol on me than the person that I know 100% of the time, even if they don't need to, they're saving that idol for themselves. Okay. Is there, we're, we're all uh, pretty bullish here on Jeremy, except for Brent, maybe Brent, <sighs> if, if this, if this doesn't go well for Jeremy, what, what does that look like? Uh, it didn't, it's it's pre uh, it's uh, merge. I I think that he would be booted like relatively soon after the merge. I don't think so there's really similar any to Stan Wandel, sir. Yes, and it, uh, exactly. I don't think there's really any scenario outside of like an idle play that you know ricochets off somebody that he could 
potentially go home pre-merge. I just don't see it. So there's just no reason to get rid of him. Why are you going to get rid of him pre-merge when there's all these other like threats? Jeremy's a really salt of the earth guy. You can trust him. He might play an idol on you. You can it, like he's loyal. He's not overly sneaky in a way that I feel like other people could be perceived, even though he's obviously someone you're not going to sit at the end with. Okay. Something something to look out for uh, that came from today's interviews is back when uh, Wendell Holland won his season, he praised a lot of things about Jeremy's gameplay. Uh, Jeremy as a person, Jeremy as a player, he just had so much love and respect for Jeremy uh, in every single way. His interview that he gave, he talked a little bit about I love the guy, but I know he's a threat and I know that I can't take him too far into the game. Uh, so it's, Wendell said know, that about Jeremy. Wendell said that about Jeremy. Okay. So it's just another one of those pairs where you might think that like there could be a connection there with how well Wendell has spoken of him in the past. But Wendell is somebody who's already acknowledging the threat level that Jeremy has. And I'm sure Wendell isn't the only one. So while it may see, you know, I, I'm sitting here saying like uh, he's going to go into the radar because that's just how he plays the game. Uh, there are people who are at least talking about him, especially somebody who likes him so much. So uh, there, there is, you know, plenty to keep an eye on, on that. Yeah. End. But I, I feel like that that's the thing that on survivor that you almost never see until you get down to like, it's like the final six, maybe seven that there's never a vote like, boy, we all respect this person so much that we yeah. have to vote them out early no just just to, just to know that wendell has that thought in his head like uh maybe maybe this isn't you know my my end game plan yeah, yeah. That, that lines up with what i'm thinking like i i think definitely wendell would grab onto somebody like jeremy if he needed you know allies in the early going but there's like once you get down to like final 10 final nine girl by i mean mm -hmm. it's it's dom and dom and wendell they uh they knew they were going to work together but they weren't going to the end together so maybe we get a similar kind of situation that would be great okay Haley. Uh, what about some other allies that are out there for Jeremy? We we've talked about Natalie. Uh, who are who are some other friendly faces that could be there for Jeremy? Um, I think him and Michelle could do well together. I think him and Denise would be a really fun pair. That's the mm -hmm. pair I would like to see. Yeah, him and yeah. Kim would be a great and, pair. Yes. Uh, any particular reason why you highlight uh, Jeremy and Denise? That do, do they have any sort of uh, uh, shared friends or anything like that? No, but I, I feel like they have a shared mentality and they're pretty even keeled. They're going to kind of, mm -hmm. you know, think about things. They're not going to react right away when something doesn't go their way or does go their way. I think they could uh, really play off each other well and be mm -hmm. able to to think plans over and develop things. I think that would be a really fun little pair. Yeah. I'm trying to think of the, the people that Jeremy has not gotten along with uh, great in the past. Uh, did not love his time with the Christie brothers. Well, uh, they're dumb. Denise yeah. Dumb. <laughs> I mean, Jenny, they, they didn't invite Fabio back for the winners at war season. Can you, uh, <laughs> can you see anybody here that would fit the profile? I thought that Keith nail also uh, was uh, somebody that Jeremy was on again, off again in his seasons. But again, uh, I don't think we have a Keith nail type either. No, really don't like, I'm like, I'm trying to think like Ben Drebergen, maybe. I don't even know if I see that. I think that honestly, Jeremy I is think just get little, along fine. I, yeah, too. that's the thing. Yeah. I'm like trying to think like who's a little bit more of like the like yeah. blue collar I mean, type. For the like, record, I, I play in a fantasy football league with both of them, and they seem like uh, <laughs> right. I actually <laughs> forgot about that. Yeah, no, I like that's the thing, and that's because. Jeremy doesn't like stupid people, and I'm sorry yeah. if you've won Survivor and you're being dumb. Dumb. yeah. So if you're if you've won a season of Survivor and you're being brought back for winners at war, you're not dumb. Like say what you want to say about your you know your game. None of these people are are the types of people that in another season where they would frustrate Jeremy. Um, mm -hmm. I think I can see him getting frustrated by like you know, unpredictable types. I could maybe see if Tony is yeah. off the rails and acting extra, um, that way, Jeremy could be like, I don't have time for this, but yeah. what, I don't what know. Am I, going back to Mr. Survivor, uh, the, uh, also, uh, very iconic Mr. Survivor 2014. Uh, it was the, the, the three-way debate between Jeremy Spencer and Tony, uh, was, <laughs> Uh, wasn't it wasn't it Vetus and Aris or was that something else? That was uh, the year before, wasn't it? That might have been twenty third. Mister Spider uh, was twenty thirteen. Uh, but this was uh, a <laughs> they, that Tony and and Jeremy uh, get into it a little bit. But I think it was really uh, both of them were picking on Spencer. 
Sounds about right. Sounds Which right, was interesting because yeah. then both of them played a season with Spencer. So yeah. uh, what, do you, what a time we all time. had in 2020. <laughs> Along the lines of like Gosh. the Spencer thing, what do you like? What do we think about like to, uh, Jeremy with Adam? I feel like he worked with Fishback. You know, the the super fan slash emotional guy kind of archetype mm-hmm. is right up his alley. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, isn't Adam like doesn't he play poker or doesn't he do Adam stuff does like play that? poker? Yeah. yeah. I feel like there's definitely a connection there and he could definitely work with him. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know if it's like gonna make the most sense for him, but I feel like if that's somebody he can just kind yeah. of keep in his pocket, I, I don't see yeah. any reason why not. Yeah. I mean I, I think it's pretty easy. Jeremy, uh, you know, put him with anybody. I think he can get along with anybody. I don't think there's anybody here that's going to really get on his nerve. So I feel like that he has, uh, you know, a, a lot of runway to work with whatever way he wants to go. Uh, Matt, is there any way that could too many people feel like they're working with him? And then it's almost like that it's uh, a, to quote uh, another person from Survivor San Juan del Sur, a potential sticky situation. <laughs> I mean, sure. Uh, I guess um, you know, since he, like, I thought he was my best friend. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if he if he does have friends on both sides of the aisle with the old school versus the new school, I could see Boston Rob being somebody who you know, both of them are still in the game. He's like, all right, Jeremy, he's hey, he's friends Jeremy. with everybody. Time to go. Yeah, but uh, I think I, that because he ha- still has a reputation for being a loyal person that. You, people can still trick themselves into thinking that they're the exception and that it's, it, you know, the relationship with them is, is real. And yeah, that, that's a good point where, whereas like, you know, with maybe I, just because we've discussed her tonight, Sarah, where she was, you know, double dealing with absolutely everyone and everyone ended up being like, no, she didn't give a shit about me either. Um, I think that that really benefits him because people, people want to, be- especially with someone as likable um, as Jeremy, like God, I like, wouldn't you want to be his number one? Um, so I think that, that even if a lot of people, if people start comparing notes, possibly that could get him into, into some trouble. But I, I do think that people might convince themselves that they are the person that he would play an idol on and that he's truly loyal to. So, and another thing, this uh, going back to the kids thing, they all have kids. They're all going to be talking about their kids 24 seven. Jeremy succeeded in second chances because he didn't talk about his kids. He didn't talk about the, the, or maybe he did a little bit, but like he didn't talk about uh, Val the unborn being pregnant one. and all yeah. that. Of course. Yeah. So uh, if they're all talking about their kids out there and Jeremy is kind of constantly subtly reminding them that he is the family guy who won the game with that big passionate speech at the end, that's probably not a good idea. Yeah. But they um, all have kids see, now. And they I don't all have know. Kids, but like that kind of reminder is not. Do they have gonna, kids? Some of them have kids. <laughs> a lot of them do. Like there's uh, Jeremy <laughs> has four. Doesn't Kim have uh, three? Kim has, Kim has three. Jeremy Robin has Amber has four. four. Like Robin there's Amber probably four. almost exactly the amount of kids. Uh, like you could probably put 20 kids. I mean, who on doesn't have kids? Nick, Adam, Sophie, Wendell. Wendell. That we know of, of all these people. Um, Nat, you said Natalie already. Does Ethan have? No, kids? we didn't say Natalie. Natalie doesn't have. Uh, yeah. Natalie doesn't have kids. Does Denise have? Oh yeah, Denise. Yes, has Denise, Denise has a daughter. Yeah. Tony yeah. has um, one or two. Tony has two, I think. Now, Tony, yeah. yeah. There's a lot oh. of kids. Yeah. Of, well, there. This like, family of parents. Is going Twenty-eight to, be a, to forty-eight. I think is the uh, yeah. So that's why I don't think that that is Michelle, as Michelle dangerous is yeah. as a as a thing anymore. Where. Um, and I don't know. I just think it's it's different. Like the big thing was like, you know, he had his two daughters and he talked about his daughters a lot because I know he talked about how like Spencer was like really bad at like pretending to like connect with people emotionally being like because he just like re- kept repeating like, oh, and so Jordan is this age and Cameron is this age. So I yeah. know he talked about his daughters a lot. It was more so that Val was pregnant and then finding he's finally going to get his first son. Whereas like now he's got two daughters. And he's got two sons. Like I think that he might be able to tone that that back and like yeah. you know rob and amber have a soccer team that they're gonna like be <laughs> trying to play for so i don't know if that's going to be as dangerous as it was before i do think it will be hard for a non-parent to win the season especially when we're talking about two million dollars is a life-changing amount that's of money a- and not and, and not anybody's going to be yeah. frivolous with the with the money that's out there in terms of these winners, but uh, I, I I do feel like that uh, that it, it would be tough for a non. I, I'd say maybe Ethan. I think Ethan is like the one non-parent who uh, I could see the jury rewarding. 
Yeah, no, that's no, a good point, Rob. Is, okay. Honestly, I had forgotten that it's two million dollars. Like, I, yeah. I know maybe yeah. maybe everybody else didn't, but I certainly did. Uh, yeah. I, I was just like in my head thinking about a million bucks, and I'm like, oh yeah, it is two million this season. So, like, even more so, I feel like definitely the people that are like uh, not so likely to win, like they're really not so likely to win now. <laughs> that reminder made me like, I don't like feeling not good about picking Natalie. So I wish that I didn't think about this, that I, I think that that is a really good point. People, obviously they want to give the money to someone that they feel like yeah. is, you know, a worthy representative oh. of the season. But I definitely think that besides likability, just feeling good that they're she getting She does have money. a niece and she's okay. close with Jeremy's kids. So, so Okay. And she has her own business too, so like I, I, I feel Profit like that, kids. yeah, there's, yeah. There's, there's maybe a way that she can circumvent that. Yeah, yeah, they need to have a purpose, and that's one of the things that's that the also worried thing. me yeah. about Natalie is that Natalie, in her interview, was talking about last time I pushed towards the second half of the game, I did it for Nadia, and I always had that motivation of I want to get revenge for Nadia, and then as Jeremy got voted out, I want to get revenge for Jeremy, and I'm doing this for for now both of them, and coming into this season, she's like, I don't know what I have to play yeah. for. She's like, I got to get something to motivate me. <laughs> Well, oh, if I if I ever play, you know, anything, then I'm just going to be like, I just want this money to give my cats like a better life. <laughs> like, is that going to go over? Well, I don't know. I, I want not. to foster uh, lots of kittens. Uh, got you know, my vote. It might Thanks, be a Matt. smart idea uh, for <laughs> people like, uh, you know, if you're if you're Nick, maybe you say I want to work with Wendell and Adam or Michelle. Or, uh, you know, I, I want to if you could sort of like, oh, boy, but these people are talking about their kids a lot. Yeah. We don't have a chance if we get to the final three that they're definitely going to uh, award it to one of the other parents out there. Maybe us people who are the people who do not have a family yet need to be working together. It's, These kids are going to run out here and steal and, all our money. Yeah, uh, I, I, I do think this came up on Survivor Ghost Island. I think that that was something that I think that I, I forget if it was something that Bradley was actually talking about or if it was something that uh, that Dominic was concerned about that that uh, he had heard Bradley might be talking about of, you know, that we have to vote out the people that have kids or the all, all the parents because uh, we don't have a shot. So uh, who knows? All right. Jeremy Collins. Uh, well, Matt, Matt's already calling this shot winner. Yeah, I uh, I mean, I think I'm not the only one who wants a woman to win this season. So I'm hoping for that. But my gut, every time that I, you <laughs> yeah. know, All right. it goes well, back to Jeremy. All right, Haley. What um, do you think for Jeremy? I feel good about Jeremy, but I don't feel the greatest about Jeremy. Okay. Jenny? <laughs> Um, we come to you for the really hot takes, Haley. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm hot take, Haley. <laughs> I think that Jeremy can do well in this season. I can see a scenario where he wins. Obviously, I've already called my shot with Natalie mm -hmm. being a winner, and I don't see a scenario where both of them. I would. Oh, can they both be winners? I would absolutely love that. So I have to say, I I, Two million. I, think, I don't think they can split it. Yeah. Um. If only. Uh. I do see him making it to the merge um but i might see like a similar finish to uh san juan del sur yeah i've already said where i'm going yeah. it's it's like merge boot or a few few boots after yeah but God, talking it through that i i wonder maybe if uh we could see a scenario that where jeremy is in good with everybody and people look around and say oh boy you know if we don't knock jeremy out right here he is going to win and you know that was kind of what almost happened to him in survivor Cambodia that it, it was Spencer who said, Hey, you know, uh, I'm telling you, Kimmy's not with us. And, uh, people that Jeremy felt, no, 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 Kimmy's Kimmy's with us. And that was a, that was a blind side. And then Kelly Wentworth played her idol. And then Jeremy played his idol and ended up being a zero, zero tie. And, uh, Kimmy ended up going home, which was another ally that Jeremy didn't have the blood directly on her, on his hands. And she was also targeting him. Uh, but there was, you know, uh, a, a, a shot, uh, at him at the final six and maybe this time around they do get him before he starts to get right into that end game where he's potentially making a fire so uh, th uh, maybe a deep run and then picked off right before he can uh, get close to that final three uh, all right just FYI really quickly about Jeremy has he ever played from like the bottom like the bottom bottom I I I, I just remember like he didn't yeah, well he oh, was he in Survivor San Juan del Sur. He was um, in down in the numbers uh, where that it, it was. There was a point where I think that 
they could have thrown a challenge uh, that it was because Reed and Josh had been together. Reed and Josh and the Christie brothers were on the tribe. And I think they could have thrown a challenge and voted him out. Okay. My my, swap. my only point in that was I remember how Jeremy acted when Kimmy betrayed him. He was like, oh, you tried to betray me? Okay. Like, I was really... Oh, he can get hot. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's, it was, it was that's like a Tyson thing. He can be a little end. entitled at times. So, like... Uh, oh, I, I, mean, I don't even want to like tell you about to... some of the text messages I've got from him about <laughs> fantasy football. I can Not as nice this. as you think, people. <laughs> I can explain this. <laughs> He's a Taurus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, tell us. Tell us so, why. Taurus can be very stubborn, and they, they also have a little bit... Like, it's, you know the bull thing. So, right. So they they can be a little bit bull headed, but Taurus are loyal. They are hardworking. Um, the way that, uh, you know, Jeremy talks about his family is so very like Taurus to me. Um, he's pretty, you know, he's protective and loyal, but you know, don't mess with him because he is a little bit bull headed. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's my, why you might see Jeremy get a little spicy at times. Another thing that's uh, great about Jeremy is that he's the only person that refers to Stephen Fishback as Steve. <laughs> Whenever anytime he mentions Stephen Fishback, he calls him Steve. <laughs> I don't think Stephen ever said, "Hey, call me Steve." I don't think that. Is, but <laughs> I don't know. He's maybe not Jer a Steve. <laughs> maybe Jeremy has he has a nickname for Jeremy. <laughs> so, uh, okay, there you go. All right, um, what what a panel tonight! I, I, I had so much fun talking about these four. Great. Likewise. Yeah. I don't get to talk about Survivor very much. So uh, this was great. Uh, yeah. like, like I said, lots of fun. Um, and it was nice that every, like the the four that we got to you know talk about tonight, they're all kind of connected in a way. Like you know, they all came from around the same time. We've got the two of them. You know, have played with each other, and pairs. yeah, it's just yep. like really. I'm I'm so happy to get to talk about these four in particular. I'm still mad at Haley for how she opened the podcast. Why would I do? Because she likes me. Rob asked who your favorite was, and he said oh. Jenny. Matt, you know I'm I love so you. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> oh, so, uh, Matt holds a grudge. Yes. Uh, Kenton wants a woman to win. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we'll take some questions from the from okay. the chat if you got them. Uh, I was gonna say, uh, and I thought about this too. Kent in the chat says, "Do you think any of them will raise the flag on the edge of extinction and go home?" Kent thinks that they will. Mm. Um, I have to say no freaking chance whatsoever we like someone come back from edge of extinction yeah. and win like that's the yeah. only example we've seen of it so you've got to think that they're like oh why would i risk it like i'm still in the game so yeah and yeah especially with the opportunity to win advance or to get advantages that could help you in the edge of extinction challenge with the fire tokens that maybe it's not like well i'm not athletic so i can't do it but maybe there's ways that you could potentially buy a you know okay buy your way to the final part or you know some other way to get into the game that's not just winning a challenge nobody nobody's leaving with two million dollars on the line yeah not happening. Mm -hmm. yeah no you need way to be on the jury and yeah. you're not going home like mm -hmm. how excited so are we to watch rob uh boston rob cast a jury vote <laughs> you feel like he has no chance matt by the way uh, I, I was thinking about this too you know they said they're doing edge of extinction and they've guaranteed them you'll have at least one chance to get back into into the game that's what probe said to dalton ross so i am moderately hopeful that they do edge of extinction for the pre-merge and then say sayonara uh, so it's not i don't for think the that they'll abandon yeah. it but what i do hope is that they stop it earlier a bit. i they, agree with they that stop yeah. it at and no in. idols stop giving them idols don't give them an idol yeah. don't give them an idol when please. they come back please Please. Do, Please do more of the like idols that expire at certain times. Like I was, I was a fan of that from 39. If you're going to be giving idols, let's like make them more like time bombs. Just watch like Chris and Tommy are going to enter the game at the final seven. <laughs> I want to run. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, I'm uh, if we have any good, any good questions, uh, uh shade to the questions, Rob. <laughs> yeah. If we have any good questions. <laughs> Pedro says, uh, <laughs> if Jeremy is a firefighter, can he devalue the other fire tokens? You see what I'm saying, Jenny? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd ask him if we had him. But, all right. Uh, so he's here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jenny, what, what sign is one? Oh, sorry. Rob. Oh, Jenny, ahead. what sign is uh, one the most times? Uh, Capricorn. 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 Woo! Yeah. Okay. yeah. We got we got a few Capricorns on this cast. Uh, Rob and Adam and 
Uh, because they're so focused on their mean, goals. They're yeah, they're th that's the thing. Like Capric Capricorns are like they get shit done, you know, and they are also they want that money. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay. All okay. right. Tomorrow night, live at 9 p.m. Eastern, we will be uh, recapping the final week of the circle and talk about the winner and how it all played out. We've got a uh, great panel coming up tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific. I believe it will be uh, myself and Taryn Armstrong, Kirsten McKinnis, and Mary Kwiatkowski, uh, and hopefully uh, the professor Tim Wilson will join us uh, one more time to talk about everything that goes on in the final week of the circle. And then on Monday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, we're going to talk about all the stragglers, the winner, the one-time players who won in the 30s. We haven't talked about. That's going to be Michelle from Survivor Korong, Adam from Millennials versus Gen X, Ben Drebergen. We're going to talk about Wendell Holland and Nick Wilson coming up on Monday night. So uh, tune in for that one. Our final preseason roundtable talking about all of the winners. Okay. Uh, Haley, what's going on on uh, The Bachelor wrap up these days? Um, there's been a couple champagne accidents, uh, over on the bachelor. <laughs> yeah. What uh, happened? I'm seeing everything sh champagne. Can you give us the quick version? Yes. So, uh, Kelsey brought champagne that she's owned for one single year to the bachelor to share in a special moment with Peter. She got that set up near a fireplace. Um, Hannah Ann came across the champagne. I think she tried to set up a champagne date with Peter as well. Mm -hmm. I producers and I'm going to say led her to that champagne, told her, pop that bottle. They did. Kelsey got super mad. Later on, Kelsey found Hannah Ann champagne. They decided to just pop that. Uh, and then she made the cardinal mistake of drinking out of a champagne bottle and it just blew up all over her face. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Never do yes, that. If you, yeah. impress, <laughs> if you want to impress, if you want to impress a hot guy on tv just don't drink straight from a champagne bottle doesn't yeah. work as well as with other bottles carbonation okay. is a bitch <laughs> okay <laughs> check out amy and Haley uh on the bachelor wrap up uh every week have you uh this this week's show is already up yeah, it's it's it in my feed. yes yes it is yeah. it went up this morning it's in the feed. Good, it's in good. The feed. check it out okay all right jenny uh what's going on with you I, I don't know. What is okay. going on with me, Rob? I'm just hanging out trying to get over pneumonia. And I did you have pneumonia? Yeah, I've got I went to the doctor finally yesterday. I've got pneumonia. So you know what? I'm podcasting with pneumonia, guys. So maybe you can be nice about my astrology <laughs> bullshit, okay? <laughs> yeah. And if anyone wants to talk about it, you can tweet at me at Jenny Autumn. And other than that, I have nothing going on in my life. So okay. <laughs> feel bad for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, Matt, I'm really what... excited for this season. Sorry. I'm very, very well, excited. What's new with you? What's new? Not much is new. Uh, I am, you know, podcasting about the challenge when that's on, but that's not on right now. Um, the Survivor All-Stars, Mary plugged it, I think, last week. We uh, went back and watched All-Stars. So if you haven't checked that out yet. Uh, what was your inspiration cast. for that? Uh, I've been a big All-Stars fan since uh, that was well, that was my what first season. What do you like about it? Uh, um, I find it to be a very, so very likable season. It yeah. is not a likable Listen, season. Listen, I didn't know you at the time. I didn't <laughs> I didn't know of your game. It was my first season. I didn't watch uh, Well, Are you a big Boston that, right? Rob guy? Yeah. A big Amber it's, guy? It, it's, it's not even mm -hmm. that our Rob lost in such a way that he did. It's that all of the people that I was rooting for got mm. axed and Boston Rob and his cronies controlled but it was, the game. Yeah. It was my first season, so I didn't uh, know anybody. And uh, I came in loving okay. Rob and Amber because they were running the season and then right. they won. And then it was just the best feel good story of all time. So Mary and myself, and it seems like more people are coming to us with like, oh, we also kind of like all stars thought it was just me. Uh, so apparently there's more of us out there. So uh, that was fun over on Kowski cast. And, uh, you know, of course, back when this, this survivor season starts up again, uh, I guess, Maybe a little sad to say that I won't be doing the three, two, one this season because I will be doing some power rankings, which uh, I just I need to talk about every single one of these players. I can't just talk about like six a week. So uh, okay. going with the big format this week, season. Uh, Matt, any takeaways from watching uh, Survivor All Stars uh, um, again? Anything away. you've noticed on the on the rewatch? Yeah, I, uh, I took away that I thought Amber. Um, 
needs to get a little bit more credit. Uh, yeah. Just overall, I think that she, uh, we got her thought process uh, pretty often throughout the late part of the game, and uh, she was definitely just as much as part of the team as Rob. Yeah, I I, th I thought that too after I uh, watched it again for the evolution of strategy. I, I I do think it's interesting. We talk more about the meat shields in terms of the thirties, but I, I want you know how much was Amber sort of uh, like hey uh, you know um like I'll, I'll go where he's going and how much was she sort of like uh you know a calculus of hey i'm gonna uh, you know i'll be fine as long as i you know put this guy out in front of me he'll lose and this is how i'm gonna win the game yeah she was she was following along with every step of the way they made decisions together she did hold him back at moments where he might have like otherwise been a little bigger you know for what he should have been in the game so uh she definitely deserves some how crazy was it to sit down and watch today a preseason interview of amber <laughs> for a season of, it was just insane to me i couldn't stop yeah. smiling the she hasn't aged it. either she looks incredible, incredible. she really looks yeah. amazing yeah yeah, yeah everyone I could does. not believe my eyes well yeah. What's crazy to me about it is that she's in there. She's like, oh, you know, nobody's going to believe that nobody's going to be looking for me. Nobody's going to expect that I'm here. And it's like, this is the same exact thing that happened last time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these, it these people her. that are like, oh, I yeah. can't. I, I have too big of a target. Everybody's coming for me. It's like, yeah, nobody's ever uh, looking for me. Uh, so we'll exciting. see if it's this time. We'll see that, uh, what happens this time. Okay. Uh, and Brent, how, how about you? Uh, I know you were so worked up about sequester it's how i watch my reality tv rob it's it's very hard for me to dis disassociate myself from my television what, well i was laughing i was laughing because yes, I, saw, I, I saw that you were very you were very <laughs> upset <laughs> about sequester and i saw that uh audrey was like ah is, we tried something <laughs> uh, like uh yeah, Brent, Brent's gonna, look listen audrey brent's gonna brent <laughs> yeah don't think he's gonna go and take it easy I, I i really liked what you said though like uh you gotta you like i i look because I told them when I first decided, you know, I, I said, I told Rob, I'd like to cover the show. You're like, you think it, it, it's it's ready to be covered? I said, yes. And I'm like, I'm going to call them as I see them, whether it's good or bad. Like, I'm, I'm not going to give the show any special treatment. I'm, I, basically, I'm the same Brent I am on Big Brother. You know, mm -hmm. I, I call them as I see them, and I'm the guy on the couch watching it. And some people appreciate it, and some people don't. But uh, I don't expect anyone to like me. I just, but uh, <laughs> that's, I am who I am. I'm like Popeye, you know, I am who I am. See, I want everyone to like me, so I can't relate. Uh, <laughs> big Libra energy. Yeah, big Libra energy. Big Libra energy. Okay. All right. There you go. All right. Uh, we have got uh, so much going on uh, this month and plenty to talk about uh, with Sequester and all this Survivor stuff going on in our patron groups. A lot of talk this week about all of the events that we have uh, planning for. We have four live shows coming up here in season 40, including a big premiere party and RHAP 10 year anniversary uh, in Los Angeles that we're doing. Lots of stuff going on. Uh, patrons are, uh, you know, grabbing up uh, tickets left and right for everything that we're doing. If you want to be part of that RHAP patron community, head on over to robhasawebsite.com slash patron for more information. Thank you guys uh, so much for listening to the podcast. Uh, Jenny Haley, Brent, and Matt had so much fun tonight. We'll be back on Monday with one more roundtable panel. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. Bye.